You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Odenkirk, the Jeff Keeble one, like just talking about what we see on the water. People really just enjoy understanding what's going on. Like, cause that was the coolest thing from the Jeff Keeble one was people talking about like the runoff. Like, I think it was Odenkirk that talked about that. Like, like if you spray stuff on your lawn, it does run into the water. And that got so much traction online. Like, oh, shit, is that true? It's like, well, yeah, it, it, it is. Like, how do you guys not know well, this? <laughs> I, I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah, well, they call it watershed on purpose. That's yeah. right. And, you know, we probably want to talk to that because the education of that, um, again, up here, I'm up at Lake Holiday <clears throat> up in Northern Virginia, not Northern Virginia, but. Anyway, when you talk to people about that, they don't really, they can't, they don't think about this water is running out, even though it's going out of the dam, it's running on a stream, that stream's running to a creek, creek's running the river, river's going to end up, like it is it's just something we don't think about. But when you see watershed, I mean, you know that, I don't have to tell you, but a lot, what I'm saying is a lot of people don't know that. They don't realize that this water is all running into your big pool there. Well, and underneath this as well. Mm. You know, for drinking and everything else we need water for. That's the whole other can of worms. I think it's important to talk about our habitat program a little bit and kind of how that relates to the health of the bay. And what we do is, we're, you know, we're an advocacy organization, but um, we are, our mission focus is habitat and, and game fish, really. Mm -hmm. um, or And then bait fish as well. So we can talk about some of that stuff. Okay, sweet. How did uh, ICAST go for you? You guys well, well, get, get a lot of deals done. Yeah, I mean, I'm not there for that so much. Like you know, buyers would typically be. Um, I mean, I'm obviously they're looking for support, but it's also just to be present and for you know Under Armour to give us the footprint they gave us at the show was awesome, and it was uh, you know having a raffle and that's of course helpful. We raised a few bucks, and and I was able to talk about um, invasive species on on Thursday, which is important. That's something else we should definitely talk about tonight. Oh, yes, um, we will be getting into that. that so is we can talk about all things Chesapeake Bay. I told my wife, I said, honey, it's not live, which is probably a problem for you. And she's like, why? I'm like, because if it were live, we'd have to like stop at some point. I'm like, tonight, we may not stop. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, yeah. having, I'm drinking water, as boring as that is. So, I mean, uh, Christ, I could probably go all night. Our, our, our record is, is two and a half hours, and we can still beat that. What are you drinking, Thomas? Uh, sponsor, sponsor Crown Royal. After getting myself in the mood because I was actually, I talked to, um, I interviewed for two and a half hours last night, uh, Nolan's brother who finished second. And we were literally got into a heated thing about the blue cats, the flatheads and the musky. Cause he grew up on the James and he says the blues are, are worse than flatheads is his thoughts. He says flatheads like can be a problem, but he thinks blue cats in general are way worse because they literally will eat anything that doesn't eat them first. Versus when he was on the Susquehanna, he said when he was there, he didn't see any bite marks on any fish or anything like that. He didn't think like the behavior of the smallmouth changed a lot. And he thinks it's only in the winter time when they have to share wintering holes, mm -hmm. which I thought is interesting because up here on the Upper Potomac and Jared, we have the guy for the DNR from Maryland coming on, I think, in two weeks to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Flathead were introduced. And so it's really uh, right now it's affected it. But I think it's interesting with with talking to you at ICAST and, and what I've heard. I didn't realize the blue cats were such a problem. Like, Absolutely! Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, are, are we good now? Are we, are we uh, yeah, yeah. We we just talk. Basically, is how this works. And then I just pick a spot and I edit out things that are probably not the best things to be on the radio. So that's how it works. I mean, so, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the blue cats. What uh, introduced in the seventies in in Virginia, and it's amazing to me how long it took them to get spread out throughout the Maryland portion of the bay and pretty much anywhere. Um, I talked to a. Uh, a Virginia guy the other day that said they're showing up at least in the winter time um, down at the mouth of the bay, where wow. the salinity is, you know, basically the ocean. It's you know, thirty-two parts per thousand. I think is above that's considered marine, and and I think it's uh, you know right around there. And I think it was twenty eighteen that the big the big migration happened. That was the period of time. I think it was twenty eighteen into twenty nineteen was the longest period of time, which was more than a year, more than three hundred sixty five days. Of, of record freshwater flows, but also just freshwater in existence in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, throughout the year, you're going to get the tide line or the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the salinity wedge, the salinity line will change 
year to year and and throughout the year um allowing fish to move but it was you know that record just allowed i think these fish to spread all over and there were always rumors of people moving blue cats to the eastern shore rivers i remember hearing rumors of that in probably probably like 2010 or so um there's been folks that that you know want them there for trophy catfish fishing um you know that happens in all the major rivers definitely on the western shore that you know folks are targeting the biggest of the blue cats for fun mm -hmm. and records and that kind of thing so i think um actually just like snakeheads i think um people that want them somewhere else have moved them over time it's mm -hmm. you know unless you know for sure it's hard to say but uh, mm -hmm. at least with the catfish i mean with the with the snakeheads it's a guarantee i mean the old five gallon bucket is what what a lot of people have done to spread them throughout the watershed and that's just to me selfish and ridiculous um you know we're talking about a public resource so to do something you think's right and everybody else be damned um i think it's the wrong way of going about this stuff and you know maybe maybe the blue cats spread out more on their own and it's in the end you're still left with this problem i think um you know with cca we, we've done our great chesapeake invasives count we're in our third year for that it's a citizen science based program on the eye angler tournament app and we're asking people to report what they're catching, where they're catching them. And that way we can track them, provide the data to Maryland DNR or Virginia or anybody that wants it within the watershed um, can access this data. But really, it's most re relevant right now to Maryland because that's where we had the majority of people tracking the catch. And it's the catch of uh, flatheads, blue, blue cats and snakeheads. And it's supported by Yamaha Outboards uh, and some other partners. <clears throat> especially local tackle shops that have been donating gift cards for people, incentivizing people participating. Um, and it runs from April 1st, to October 31st. So doing that, I mean, the Yamaha's big focus is to highlight all things that are happening with aquatic invasive species across the country. Um, that's part of what I was talking about at, uh, at ICAST, um, you know, Yamaha and, and many other partners are supporting a kind of a national effort that's happening both on, on land and water um amongst sportsmen groups so that we can be kind of the tip of the spear and educate people and have them understand the impact that these invasive species have so you know focusing in the water it's not just finfish um i think a lot of folks are aware of uh you know the boat washing that needs to happen from the various plants and, and even shellfish that can um that can go from lake body to lake body so where where our focus is in the chesapeake where the focus is on the finfish side of things because we're an angling organization you know, I felt like that's where we can make our greatest impact is kind of turning recreational anglers into citizen scientists. Um, but no matter where people are in the country, there's going to be some sort of um, non-native species that is listed as invasive, meaning it has an outsized impact on the ecosystem. Um, it's kind of a judgment call. It's a line that that folks draw to decide what we do with these things. Um, and, you know, the way we look at it is you know, there's a lot of, lot of debate on good and bad um, but I like to focus on on what the agencies say um, from an invasive or not invasive standpoint for our work, at least, um, because a lot of the work we do, we try and, and focus on on, um, I guess, the, the best science available and within that realm of fisheries management. So while somebody can say all day long that that snakeheads are great and we want to spread them all over the place, well, the regulatory agencies that oversee these waterways say differently. And so we're there to support them and, and not really get into that opinion side of things, even though I have an opinion, you know, everybody I run into has one, but we try and organizationally really just support greater knowledge. And that's where the data comes in. Dave, could you tell everyone at home uh, before we get too deep into this, uh, like who you are and what organization that's probably good for the people that have been living under a rock? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm the executive director for Coastal Conservation Association, Maryland. Um, and I guess first and foremost, I'm an obsessed, obsessed, <laughs> obsessed angler and hunter. Um, you know, spent my most of my life um, in the outdoors, um, and when not hunting or fishing, it was still in the outdoors. You know, I was that little kid that played around in the woods and the creeks of um, Ellicott City, is where I grew up in Maryland. Um, and then I went to college to study mechanical engineering at West Virginia, WVU. So, you know, spent plenty of time out there in the in that part of the world, um, and. Pretty much from college uh, until now, I'm, I'm now 40 years old, um, graduated in 04. Um, pretty much that timeline, really up until about six or seven years ago, um, I was a uh, self-employed um, home builder, working in a family business, working as a realtor. And um, 
in property manager and I was single, no kids and filled my wall like behind me. Um, all these are adventures and, and keepsakes from those adventures of hunting and fishing. And I used to tell people all the time that, um, you know, working in a business that's high stress and, and can have great rewards, but also some of the lowest lows as the economy goes up and down. And, you know, in, in our building business, it was me my dad and, and his business partner and then subcontractors. So it was very small. And I got to see all the kind of push and pull of regulations and opinions and politics and how it affects our ability to do business. Um, a big part of, of things that impact us is, is of course, regulation. Um, building within the watershed um, has a lot of red tape. Um, and then, and also just being able to borrow money and kind of advance your way through business. I got this really well-rounded experience. And then when it was time to turn the business side off, I'm very fortunate that my dad is my best friend to this day. Um, he actually lives two doors down from me. Oh. Um, and he and I spent, I don't know, 15, 20 years, if not longer while we were working together, um, hunting and fishing together. That's cool. So, That's yeah, awesome. it's something that, you know, he, he actually started hunting with me about, about when I started when I was about 12. Um, that was his real first jump into it. He'd been a little bit here and there with some folks in the building business, but always waited till I was old enough. Um, I have two older sisters, so he was always occupied by their things as well. Um, mm -hmm. And as a good dad, he really took time to focus on family first. So all that led me to kind of where I am today. Um, on the fish side of things, we would go fishing and I got to go a lot. Um, and I used to always tell people and when business was slow, um, I would personally spend almost every penny I had to go fishing because it was just what fueled me and made me, you know, enjoy, enjoy life. And, um, and then I started volunteering for CCA. So I, I specifically remember like hearing about it on, on social, on not social media, cause that didn't exist at that time <laughs> or was barely starting at that time. But, um, I remember seeing things on their various chat forums. And, and running into people and seeing meetings that would occur that were more like, you know, ed educational or I would have a speaker and, and, you know, like a fishing club. And so I remember going to a couple on, on our, for the CCA Kent Narrows chapter. And, you know, it was a topic on catching stripers on the fly was, was one thing that st stood out that I definitely learned from a network of people I met in CCA. And that was something I was interested in. Um, and so I, I went to one of our first meetings and walk in, there's a bunch of people, there's a speaker. And I find out, oh, the organization does more than just gather and talk about fishing. Uh, we're actually an advocacy organization and one that stands up for the future of fishing, one that stands up for the angler's voice in state capitals. And I thought, huh, I take my small business experience and kind of like the bumps and bruises that go with that and then focus that on something that, you know, protecting what's near and dear to me on my time off. Like I can get down with this. This is something I'm interested in. And yeah. And it was, it was, you know, it was partly back to that. No wife, no kids. Um, and I definitely could have worked more, <laughs> um, but I definitely um, put all that passion and energy into learning fisheries management, learning what CCA does, kind of what we were founded on. So that's a long story, but I'll gladly tell it a little bit of it at least. Um, so in, let me get to where, I, how I landed in this seat and I'll go back to what CCA does. Um, um so ultimately, I volunteered for quite some time, and then an opportunity came up where the executive director position was open in Maryland. Um, and I thought, is this something I want to try and do full time? Um, you know, the real estate thing I, I would jump back into tomorrow um, if need be, but but it's not my passion. I mean, there's nothing exciting about contracts and loan officers and all that kind of stuff, um, at least not in my world. Um, but so, to, so I had the opportunity to blend my passion, um, something I've been volunteering to do for more than a decade, you know, getting involved in fisheries management, um, and turn, try and turn into a, you know, take the opportunity to turn into a job. And so after a, a long process, I was selected as executive director. Um, and that was February 1st of 2017 was day one for me, uh, full time. So it went from just kind of dipping my toes in the policy water a bit to all of a sudden having this organization to run. And so. Uh, we're not too different than like Ducks Unlimited, Trout Unlimited, in that we are a membership organization. So we ask folks to be a member. It's 35 bucks a year. If you're a member here in Maryland, you can be a member across the country. It doesn't matter what state you live in. Um, but where we're different than, than some of the other organizations is that we have independence within our state chapters. So we're all one company. Um, it's based in Houston, and I'll talk a little bit about its founding um, in some of the other states. But... Um, it was founded in 1977, actually. So wow, that's an important number in Texas. That's where it started. 
Um, and then fast forward to 1995, a group of folks in Maryland looked around and said, you know, hey, we want to step up. We want to create a larger voice for anglers, for the resource, really. Um, we, we always try and focus on putting the health of the resource first. Um, and then, yes, the angler access, you know, next, because we are the public and that's who the resource belongs to. So um, in 1995, a small group of folks got together in Maryland, in Easton. Um, that was our first chapter. It was called the Midshore Chapter. And, and said they're going to raise a, have a fundraiser, raise some dollars, officially incorporate as CCA Maryland. Um, so we're set up doing business as CCA Maryland here. And our number one rule is that the dollars raised here in Maryland stay here in Maryland. So the membership's national. Our membership department's in Houston. Um, you know, the dollars from that do support important operations that, that happen there in the hub. Um, but there's states just like Maryland around the around the coast. So um, we started in Texas. Similar thing, group of guys and gals were, were kind of upset with the way that speckled trout and redfish fishing was happening down in the Gulf. And they didn't feel like they had a voice in Austin. So, you know, they, they got together, created this organization. It was called the Gulf Coast Conservation Association. And uh, it worked. Um, I think by 1983, 1983 is the year we became Coastal Conservation Association. And I, I think that's the year that Florida came on board and you know, in our wake in, in, of successes in the Gulf is, is making redfish and, and speckled trout game fish, or at least banning inshore gill nets, nearshore gill nets. Um, we also have a really robust habitat program in the Gulf that's, that's been one to, to really strive to, to try and match um, up here. Um, because down in the Gulf, of course, there's so many reef fish and the more and more habitat you can create, the more these fish can actually um, repopulate and grow and thrive. Um, you know, anglers think of um, like a reef or habitat, we think, or we think of the fish in the stage at which we want to catch it, mm -hmm. right? Like we think about the big ones or whatever it is you might target, like, you, you know, but you, you kind of have, you forget often about where they start. And, and that's one thing that CCA has done recently. So, you know, from 77 around the coast, 83 up the coast, um, we have chapters with full-time staff from Maryland uh, down to Texas um, and then a full West coast. And one of the reasons that we're, we're set up the way we are is that nobody knows their issues better than the people right, right there, right? Mm -hmm. So there's pluses and minuses that come with national versus local um, or state level. And there's no perfect model um, for an organization like ours, but it's given, like for me, my personal experience, it's given me the opportunity of somebody that's passionate, interested in, in the resource and care about it. It's such an important part of my life. And then it gave me a pathway to stand up and, and, make some positive impacts and be surrounded by like-minded people that want to do, do the same. And when you do that, you work together, um, you can really go far. Um, and I think, but anyway, I could, I'm, I can blab in circles on this, but um, ultimately that's what CCA affords the angler uh, to know that, you know, by being a member, by being engaged, uh, they can help affect some positive change. Um, it's a whole heck of a lot better than sitting back and arguing with folks on Facebook or, um, other platforms that happen, you know, the way people in, interact with each other these days, um, you know, the CCA folks, I always find they're the volunteers and the people that are stepping up to get things done mm -hmm. and, and do a lot of hard work. So what I'm hearing you say too, which is so cool is it's kind of, it's grassroots and you don't have to have like your experience level kind of needs to be, you're an outdoorsman. And like you're saying, you're, you're, you're a fisherman, you know, you're an angler, you enjoy fishing and you want to be an advocate for that resource. And, yep. and so anybody can do it. We all can do it. It kind of takes everybody, you know, to do this. You were talking earlier about um, people can, uh, anglers can log those fish. How do they go about doing that? Yeah. So our, our website is ccamd.org. And um, if you go to our homepage, you'll see, if you scroll down, you'll see the great Chesapeake invasives count. And there's a whole page there that describes it. Um, but it's not only on your smartphone. So there's a um, there's an app um, that was created by a, a group in Florida. Um, actually, this is a, a great story because it's the same spirit with which we're doing what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. And so, um, gosh, I can't remember the year right now, um, but the there were a series of freezes in Florida that killed a lot of the game fish on the West Coast. Um, and Florida, um, the you know, fishing game folks um, had said. Uh, I guess it's Florida uh, Fish and Wildlife Commission, um, had looked to various groups to say, hey, what can we do to get a really good hold of what's happened out there? Like, we need to know what a lot of these fish, um, what's happened to a lot of the population of these fish with these freezes. 
And so very quickly, a group came together and created this app, um, an app called iAngler. And that app gave people the ability to go out, take pictures, submit what they would typically would be catching. And that's kind of where it ends up, right? Um, but ultimately, they were surveying and trying to figure out um, what, what was out there, what was floating dead, et cetera. And then anglers started reporting their catch. And mm -hmm. so um, the basis of the fisheries management system with fish that we catch is surveying anglers to understand what they catch and how much time they spend doing it. And it's something called catch per unit effort. Mm -hmm. um, the what what iAngler was able to do over a period of time was get a massive amount of data to the, the FWC folks so that they could say, okay, if we look at our state-based stock assessments or population assessments, um, what is this data coming in? It's like so much more data than normal. What is it telling us about the current status? And so there, there's in statistics and in, in these models and such, there's always a max of, of how much data is necessary to be accurate or to have a pretty good understanding of what's happening out there. Um, but having a lot of data is, a, you know, is step number one, really. Um, mm -hmm. You almost want to have too much. And so ultimately, they proved the point in Florida that, you know, anglers can go out and collect this information bring it, bring it back to the managers and the managers can better assess the impact and then decide what they let us do from an access perspective, because if there's not enough fish out there, you can't let people go fishing as much because mm -hmm. they likely impact that population's ability to grow. So mm -hmm. with invasives, we're on the flip side of things, um, at least for now. Um, we're collecting data. And, and one of the things that's important is not only that catch per unit effort, um, we're really not specifically asking people to tell how much time they're spending and that kind of thing. Um, but ultimately we're getting an understanding of like the length, uh, the, the catch composition. So if a lot of people are sending in pictures of a 22 inch snakehead in this one little water body, then the biologist can go backwards and go, okay, we know that they're X number of year class. And if this is a new phenomenon in a certain Creek, then they can basically, they can essentially guess when those fish got there, you know, their, their spawning success, their abundance. Um, and so I'll get back, back to the original question. Um, when you go on the website, um, it's ccamd.org and then slash count is the direct link to the invasives count. So you download the iAngler tournament app and it's pretty intuitive. We've been using this, this tournament app for most of our fishing tournaments for years now. Mm -hmm. um, most of our tournaments that CCA runs throughout the year are um, catch photo release format. Uh, and so, um, even before we mandated release of things like striped bass, because the population's not doing well, um, this gives people the ability to release the fish um, because they're taking a picture of the fish against a ruler, following the prompts on the app, answering the questions that need to be answered, hitting submit. And and so with the snake, with the invasives, um, we're, we're awarding people that give us the location because that improves. That's one more piece of data attached to that fish, that that fishing activity. Um, we don't require people to give us a location, but in order to get one of the prizes that we do, mm -hmm. um, you have to give the location. So it's really just take a picture of the fish against the ruler, just like so many tournaments have become mm -hmm. these days. And, and we'll see. I mean, I, I have these ideas of what some of this information will tell us. Um, some of the stuff I was just saying might be a little off. I mean, I, I really, I, I'm very fortunate to hang out with a lot of, or be able to work with a lot of very, very smart and well-trained, experienced, you know, field biologists, uh, folks in, in multiple states. And I tell people all the time, I hang around a lot of really smart people and try and absorb and, and then share what I've learned from them. Because, right. yeah, you know, like, I mean, such a big part of CCA's role is to advise and educate the public on the conservation of marine resources. And because, I mean, think about it, you can't be a good advocate unless you're educated, unless you're coming to the table with facts. Um, and so that's kind of step one. And it's not, I, I tell people all the time that I really focus on um, not telling people what to think, but but leading that horse to water, teaching people that, you know, there's an opportunity for you to engage, to learn, here's some great resources, but I'm not going to tell you what to think. I'll tell you what I think, but right. I'm not, I'm not the, the kind of advocate that's just like, you know, click this button and say what I say, because mm -hmm. I think I'm right. I mean, I think... You know, everybody can go about it their own way, but mm -hmm. I really focus on trying to empower the angler and, and not say right or wrong, but just say, look, these are your options within the law. And maybe things would be better if we did X, Y, and Z from a policy perspective. So, How is policy set in the sense of, does it take a grassroots uproar to create a new policy? Like, how does that whole process go about? It, it, 
So let's say something happens on the bay. Like, how does that whole process go down, like in a cliff note? Because I know people just are dying to hear about like how Congress works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, first, I'm terrible at cliff notes, um, but uh, I answer long questions, and I say I'm, I must be part like rabbit because I run a big circle. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll eventually good information. Though. It's all good. Yeah. Well, so um, it all depends on what what resource we're talking about. If we're talking just you know, resource policy, the, the arena I work in. Um, um, so I'm actually, well, well, CCA, I mean, we focus on our membership is what drives us. Uh, we fundraise through our membership, through banquet fundraisers and other, other ways. Um, and that's so we can affect advocacy and become advocates for policy change, but also do habitat work that I briefly mentioned a little, a little ago, and I'll, I'll definitely get back to tonight. Um, so, it all depends on who has the authority to manage that resource. Um, if it's within a state, then it's a little simpler. Um, it typically rolls up to the state capital and the, the Fish and Game Agency in Maryland. It's Maryland DNR that, that oversees uh, fisheries. Um, within Maryland DNR, there's lots of different um, components. And folks forget or may not remember, but um, they're part of the executive branch, um, DNR. And so that's the governor, you know, the state house. Um, the governor is is the boss there, um, and so it all depends on what policy we're talking about. But typically, the legislature gives the executive branch authority to do things. Um, so they give them the authority within the state of Maryland to enact certain actions based on the state law, because uh, the legislature makes laws. So depending on it, where it what it is, it can start in, in various places. Um, Another hat I wear is uh, I'm the chair of the Sport Fisheries Advisory Commission for Maryland DNR, and that's a governor-appointed advisory commission um, where we advise the the fisheries director and I went up to the secretary of DNR on on fisheries issues, and um, I, I try I generally explain that as a kind of a two-way street. You know, we when I say we, it's it's 15 individuals that are selected from different parts of the state um, to to volunteer. And they can apply at, at various points uh, of the year, and and every term has a has a like a three year term, um, and so I actually got appointed to that for the first time in two thousand and nine to represent CCA, um, and so this is a place where, um, at one time we would meet like ten times a year and and go through an agenda. Um, the meetings are run by like Robert's Rules of Order. There's a chair, there's vice chair, there's members of the public that can weigh in. There's an agenda, um, and so it's just like any town council or anything you can go to, and and. That advisory body um, ideally is working through the issue to try and give a stakeholder perspective to the regulators, the agency, um, the fisheries director, and on up to the secretary. You know, the secretary in Maryland is part of the governor's cabinet. So again, it's all under the governor there. Um, we, in fact, today I actually sent a message to some folks um, within DNR because I, I got some information from some stakeholders and they're interested in talking about something at the next um, advisory commission meeting. So that could be the start of a new policy. Um, that policy could be a regulation that the department creates if they have the regulatory authority to manage the you know, said issue. Um, it could be a situation where the agency goes into the legislature next session, um, which is a 90 day period in the beginning of the year in Maryland and says, hey, legislators, um, we have this issue. We would like to change the law. We want either want you to give us the authority to do something or you know, dictate that we do it. And so that's a whole other place that that rules are made and, and actions are initiated to, to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, and that's a place that actually I've engaged a bunch recently. Um, looking around, I have a pen somewhere with the governor signed a bill this year. Um, that was pretty cool. So here's a for example. Um, and I, would go yeah, ahead. I, okay. no, I had a question too, because I can remember probably three to four years ago, we took a charter trip, I believe it was out of Easton, um, going after stripers. And I, and I remember the charter boat captain, like we caught one, I don't remember if it was a four or six hour trip, but we had, you know, one fish and, mm -hmm. and he was pretty disappointed and, and he was putting a lot of blame on the commercial fishing industry. And so, and I'd imagine this falls into that where you, in that case, you got somebody making a living now, uh, which is different than two than the recreational angler, mm -hmm. but it still goes into, to your point, you know, that kind of, balance and, and regulating, you know, certain entities. Um, I don't know whatever came of that or if it's improved or not. Uh, but as a consumer too, it was kind of like, yeah, one fish, but, and that's fishing though too. So it's not yeah. that you're not always going to success. But I remember that being kind of a sticking point with, 
with this charter boat captain. And I imagine some people in those cases are put out of business because if the big commercial guys are going out and raking them in, you know, is that is that really good for the resource? Yeah. Yeah. And there's always like that's probably you're talking about straight bass, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So recently, overall, um, it's another hat I wear. I sit on the striped bass management board uh, for the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. So that's a case where this is a fish that swims across state lines, doesn't mm -hmm. know, you know who's who, what's what on shore. Right. Um, so after in the 1980s, when the moratorium was enacted in Maryland for five years, um, there was a shutdown of, of harvest. And actually, um, CCA has a pretty cool um, uh, seminar series we've supported. Uh, called the past present and future of striped bass um, we've done the past and the present we're headed to the future um and of course uh literally september 22nd um and that's that's on fish talk magazine um a live stream kind of like 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 this um where we talk about a lot of this stuff so i'll definitely point that you, you to that because i think you'll find it informative at least the big picture pieces of the striped bass fishery um the whole one fish limit um the ultimately Fisheries managers have three different things they can affect to manage recreational fishing. And that's the number of days on the water, the length of the fish, and then the bag. How many fish can you keep, the creel? Uh, and that's really their tool that they use to estimate what's called fishing mortality. On a commercial fishery, in what we call a mixed use fishery, like the striped bass, um, the commercial fishery typically has a max quota um, that could be doled out by a state in actual numbers of tags. Um, or there, there's, there could be a tag component. It's going to be a little different with each state. Um, but ultimately, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission is the place that was created um, to deal with interstate fisheries issues. And it, it, it's, it ta it's made up of states from Maine to Florida, as well as the Potomac River Fisheries Commission, a interstate commission created by the Virginia and, and Maryland to determine how do you manage the fisheries in the Potomac. Um, and so it's really an exercise in states' rights in, in many ways is what the commission is. Um, the governor gets to select an appointee um, that they choose, and that's one of the three people. A legislator gets to select an appointee or serve in the seat themselves. Um, and then there's an administrative seat, which is also selected by the governor through the agency. It's quite often the fisheries director or a species expert. Um, and so ultimately that body is the one that the states are coming together to say, you know what, we'll work together to determine the status of the stock um, through a stock assessment or a fishery assessment of population and then figure out who gets to take home, home what from a state by state by state level. Then when you get back home, um, you've got to figure out who gets to catch it. And technically, uh, a dead fish is a dead fish. But as soon as you add in that stakeholder level and then we all start wearing different uniforms, um, it gets complicated, and that's exactly where your experience, right? And so ultimately, the population of striped bass has been declining for the last decade plus. Um, CCA, uh, I just saw some memory the other day of um, like 2014, we were calling for ratcheting down the catch mm. because we saw poor recruitment, poor reproduction happening, and the overall population going down at a, at a rate that we didn't want. We want a high abundance of fish so people can go out there, have fun, take them home for dinner, and you know, release them if there's a lot of them. Um, mm -hmm. Have a good day on the water. And spend a lot of money in the local economy. What is the what is the 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 cycle of striper for the last like 20 years? You said since 2010, you've seen a decline. Like uh, for the people at home that don't know, I mean, again, striped bass are probably the the criminal when it comes to the Chesapeake Bay yep. area. Um, there was, I mean, it was in the 90s before the Clearwater Act was passed. Uh, like striper were basically on 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 the downside. Then they bounced back, and then mm -hmm. now they're going back down. So I'm assuming then you're saying around spitballing here, the early 2000s was probably the peak of, of the striped bass population. And usually it's never just one thing, but what do you think the factors are that is leading to this decrease in the striped bass population? Well, it's partly, ultimately you're assessing a population of fish that you can't see and they move, right? So you try and guess what's born. Um, you observe through various surveys. One of those could be of, of anglers to understand that catch per unit effort I was talking about and other things. Um, and then um, you put all that information together and that's the stock assessment coast wide. And so that stock assessment is what tells us the status of the fishery. Um, and then ultimately, like I was saying a minute ago, determines who gets to take them. Um, and, um, and the last point on that before actually, before I get going further is you have the private angler 
uh, you, we've now talked about folks in the for hire sector a little differently because of that business component. Um, and then you have the commercial side of things. I'm a big believer in the recreational fishery being the recreational fishery. And that includes anybody from going down to a dock or a beach and going fishing by yourself with a group, doesn't matter. Uh, private land, public land, don't care. All the way up to hiring a professional, like a charter captain to take you fishing. As far as I'm concerned, the individual right. is the individual. And it's just the means in which they're accessing the resource mm -hmm. as a recreational angler. So there's recreational fishing that includes for hire in my brain, in my mind. Makes um, sense. In the policy world, it's changing. There's mm -hmm. winners and losers coming, which is pretty typical when you see what's happening with straight bass. So uh, the moratorium enacted in 85, uh, closed until 90, um, and then slowly but surely reopened. And not every state closed. Some states closed for a short period of time. Some states didn't at all. Um, but ultimately, we, what that what that allowed was um, recruitment issues or issues with fish being born to kind of keep up or catch up in the mm -hmm. Chesapeake. You know, they weren't, weren't being harvested at a small level. Mm -hmm. um, there were years, many, many years of, of no size limits. Um, people would fill a cooler with small rockfish. Um, and so then the peak, yeah, the early 2000s, I want to say 04, maybe 07. I can't remember the exact specific peak on the, on the chart right this moment. Um, but that's all the stock assessment. And so where folks can find this information is going to the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission website. And that's asmfc.org. Um, all the species they manage are all listed on individual pages. And there's all these different links on that information. And it's definitely for the technical minded. Um, but ultimately what that shows is we did rebuild the fishery to a peak. Um, and then we saw that decline. And that decline, I'm going to say again, started about a decade ago, depending on your perspective. Many people said that it was these, you know, these natural ups and downs, and that's okay. Um, we were really calling for um, the tightening of fisheries regulations. So therefore, we would lower what's called fishing mortality or removals from the fishery, from the population, and therefore allow a little more stability. Hope because the striped bass, just from a biological standpoint, um, only only spawns effectively we've observed in history only only spawns effectively a couple times out of a decade wow and that's part of the reason that we some folks also say like when you get to a breeding age fish which is age seven eight nine um by the time that all the fish have recruited into being you know spawners um once they make it leave them alone and let them spawn a lot so you have a lot of spawners and they may not be successful each year mm -hmm. at least you're you have a lot of them mm -hmm. and there's other people that that it's not exactly like a tit for tat but there's also folks that say that it's important to let a fish spawn at least once so that that one fish gave to the future generation um, and that makes total sense but it also to me when you have a fish that i'd rather have it repeat a lot Mm -hmm. likely take place take part in a successful spawn rather than just spawn once and then die um and not have a chance to to succeed um and what drives the spawning success is habitat um meaning actual structure um more from a what happens to that fish after it's born you know you need grasses you need reefs you mm -hmm. need rocks, marshes um but then also habitat in the water column and folks forget about that I mean, fish have to have a temperature component that they're good with. They have to have, um, you know, what's in the actual water can't be fatal to them. Um, there's also a component with striped bass where when they're born, they're eating these tiny little microscopic phytoplankton. And there's a certain condition in the wintertime, in the watershed, in the area that can drive a boom in that, of availability of that food. And there's certain conditions that can make that food unavailable. Mm. So many things that are impacting what could mean success or failure for these fish. That's why a group like CCA and, and many in the recreational fishing community say, well, oh, pump the brakes as soon as you, you see some concern, you know, up ahead. And that's where a lot of folks immediately look to the commercial side and go, well, you know, because they're, they're, it's rare that a, that a commercial fishery is going to call for cuts right. as, as quickly as a recreational fishery would, mm -hmm. especially a group like CCA. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's oversimplified to say that we're anti-commercial. Um, that's not the case. Um, but, you know, when it comes down to it, it's about the health of the resource. And then yeah, as the long as the resource can provide, yeah. I yeah. got a stupid I got a stupid question. Um, in Virginia, we do stocking programs for striper. And we do it for freshwater. Like, I, I'm not saying just logistically and financially. So let's take the financial side of it, of course. Like, is it 
possible to do a stocking program to help habilitate a species that only spawns, like, as you said, maybe successfully a couple times a decade is, is that first before we think about like financially, it's probably not, but can we do it? Yeah. Yeah. So essentially those fish spawning successfully only a couple times a decade was kind of by natural design. I mean, literally not kind of, <laughs> it is right. Like we didn't choose that. Um, uh, red drum or another species like that. They're, a, they're what we would put in the category of long, long lived species. Um, now, red drum and stripers are completely different in their spawning approaches, but um, they're both long lived. And once, once they're sexually mature, they're going to keep spawning a lot if you let them. So it's, I've seen it said by, again, those smart people I get to hang around with that there's no way on earth that a striped bass hatchery could do what just one good spawn could do. And so we couldn't, could never grow the volume of fish that like one good spawn, like all things line up on one of the Maryland rivers where the major spawning area is and just let nature, nature do it. Um, plus, I mean, you could literally, but a good way of thinking about that is you could have a hatchery. Um, so here's a, here's what happens a lot of times with striped bass and what leads to failure. Um, it's actually similar with what affects like smallmouth, um, like flows on the Potomac river have been a major part of impacting smallmouth reproduction and populations recently. The same thing can happen lower down on the Potomac River is a striped bass spawning area. Mm -hmm. So if you have temperature shocks or if you have high flow, different salinity changes, that can affect those fish. And it could be day one that they're a little larval egg floating around. It could be day 50. I don't know the exact biology of it. Maybe, I don't think we know necessarily. Um, but think of if you're in a hatchery situation, Every hatchery has challenges with with creating, you know, the, the larvae mm -hmm. that they're creating, no matter what species it is. Right. Um, and imagine you do all that work and then fail. Um, so is it worth it? It would be. I mean, I, I'm not it's, if somebody came to call me tomorrow and said, hey, I want to build a straight bass hatchery. I mean, it's worth the, the, the focus. Um, that work was done in the 80s. But I think we did learn a lesson that like, oh, my gosh, Mother Nature just. Mm -hmm. that she knows best. And I think this is important because I've heard this before about in certain areas about like, just just stock, just stock. And, and and you see this a lot. And it's good to bring this up to not just financial, but let's just look at the logical. Of will it actually work and have an effect? Um, I know the upper Potomac is interesting, too, because like that's almost different because I remember uh, Kelby was talking about this for the Shenandoah where there might be a genetic problem. We're introducing just a different brood to help the gene pool might be better. But besides that, the other factors that I want to get into now is also the forage. And mm -hmm. if you look at certain places like Susquehanna, one thing that might be leading to better spawn quality is it's a smorgasbord. There's so much they can pick from. And I think this leads into habitat, which is what I want to talk about, mm -hmm. and flathead or, and blue cats. And is there a drop in not only the striper, but what is it like for the shad runs that are just so important? I, I, I could be wrong. That seems so important for the striped bass population. Yeah. Well, it's really as simple as um, competition within the existing habitat, within the basic, yeah, the basic forage that's available. So um, <laughs> the baby boom was great for America <laughs> in growth and everything and population and economy and everything else, but it's actually led to an environmental change that we've seen just by us existing. You know, the population continues to grow in the watershed. So even forget the fish for a second, our impact on the waterways continues to increase. Mm -hmm. And even with major effort and focus, um, there's not this turning point of like everything's getting better and we can see downstream that everything's getting better. So that's part of it. And that's a big habitat piece of the puzzle. Um, the water that flows from, you know, where you guys are, I'm here, I'm here in Baltimore. We have a problem with, with our sewage plant that continues to have, you know, for 50 years now we've had leaking. Mm -hmm. um, so that's extra nutrients into the system, right? The same thing's happening. Every wastewater outflow has an issue. I don't care. Mm -hmm. The best of the best is probably Very. Blue Plains, but um, who knows? They keep trying, but how many failures can we have, right? So just keep thinking about all that. Mm -hmm. All that's impa impacting the, the health of the waterways, um, and that is habitat. And then you have the structural habitat, too, which can change depending on the species. It can change on water flow. The whole other component, right? So not only what's the quality of the water is, what's in it, and what life it can support based on its condition, um, but then you have the flow component, and you need flow at certain times of year. 
Mm -hmm. Um, We're seeing that unfold all over this country, like especially out west with drought and whatnot. I mean, you just don't have the water you used to have. So anyway, you get down to the food component. All those things affect food as well and their life cycles. Because all these little fish are Mm -hmm. reproducing in shad. So American shad and hickory shad, the the oceanic migratory ones, um, you know, they used to be in such abundance that it was, you know, just it's George Washington would tell stories, you know, how, you know, that was a big fishery he participated in on the Potomac. Delaware River was a big one. Yeah, Delaware River. I mean, Chad literally saved, you know, the the revolutionaries creating America. Um, You know, they call them the founding fish. Um, They used to be in such high abundance. And um, a big part that impacted them um, was the industrial revolution, the damming of so many rivers on the East Coast. And I mean, never forget from below Washington, D.C. to Boston, is the highest density of population in the country. You know, forget the pop Houston, Chicago, LA. Yeah, they're massive. But over the longest history of our country, Washington to Boston is our population. And so there's mills and places that, that created power uh, eventually, but water supply. Um, you know, there's a water supply lake right up the hill from my house here that um, actually Robert E. Lee worked at right after uh, mm-hmm. West Point. Um, and it was a saltpeter mine and they were, they actually dug you know, some of the components of the gunpowder for Fort McHenry, which is down that way a little ways, um, to defend Baltimore Harbor. So you have to think about all these things were happening as we built our country and nobody was really thinking like, what's this going to do to the health of the waterways and these fish that show up every spring. It really wasn't until like the seventies when environmentalism, the EPA was created clean water act, clean air act, um, implemented actual regulations to say that these places would be protected. And many would say that it may have been too late in some, some cases. So for shad specifically hickory and Americans, um, they're in moratorium in our coastal waters, in our, in our States here up and down the Atlantic coast. Um, they are actually managed by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. They have a, a management plan. They have an, a stock assessment. There's a lot of information on their life cycle and stuff. Um, river herring as well. Um, but the long story short is that they're just not as successful as they once were because either their spawning reaches are blocked by dams. They were too many were caught um, at least. And that's so like you got to remember. Too many were caught is kind of like my judgment. Mm-hmm. Maybe that level of catch had nothing to do with their trend and their loss. Mm-hmm. I will never know. Right. Mm-hmm. But. That's what we do. We can affect catch right. more quickly. We can't necessarily affect what's happening in these rivers over a, a century. You, you said there was data on the on the striper. Do you have uh, data basically to extrapolate out with that with the shad, like when their peak was, their decline, how long that has been for? Because I, I I think that's actually good bedtime material to read. Um, that is so that is the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, okay. and I actually have it up on my other screen. Um, there's, I like pictures. I always joke around. I say, you know, I like ordering from a, a restaurant that has pictures on I'm the same way. I can relate. <laughs> so there is an endless, endless, endless amount of fish nerd fodder on the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission website for all these species. And I recommend, like, this is what I used to do when I first started getting involved, and I still do it, um, is I would read these documents and just, you know, read it and read it and read it and read it and then look at it and then find the pictures and try and understand the basic concepts that management was telling us was happening and then i would reflect and relate that to my own water experience and then Mm -hmm. show up at a meeting hopefully a little more informed than the average Mm -hmm. angler um and then say you know this is what i think based on my experience so Mm -hmm. i'm just looking at um like a lot of times um they may not know the population i mean we don't know the population of striped bass Mm -hmm. we estimate the population of striped Mm -hmm. bass so I do see that the uh, U.S. landings peaked of river herring in 1968, 69, it looks like. Uh, bottomed out in 1983 and then had a slow growth in, you know, up until more recently that went back down. Um, do we even know how many were caught? No. I mean, you're looking at what's that one right there. Um, annual landings of, there's American Chad. So same idea, like, um, you know, well past George Washington there in the beginning and then um those ups and downs um you know, see so like you don't know why in the what is that the 1890s why there were no landings was there no data that's the stuff that, in, that intrigues me sometimes 
Yeah, because like, you know, like, so if you guys don't know, like Theodore Roosevelt started really a TVA system that really started down the Carolinas, TVA, that built all the dams. And it really started south and north and worked its way towards Virginia because they were going to dam up the, the Potomac River until that got shut down by, I think, the EPA in the 60s because uh, mm-hmm. it was the idea of just damming up all the rivers. So it's interesting that like the damming process did start in the 1940s and the 60s. So it would make sense that you would see that trend up, the dams get built, and then it's that, that slower appreciation down. But I also think it's interesting to know about like the habitat where it comes to the grass, um, things like that. Is there anything else besides the dams that did this? And then we're yeah. putting in fish ladders. Would that help? There, I mean, there. What they've done with the salmon on the west coast is fat is just fascinating to be able to keep that going. Is this something we can actually do, um, just to help this? Yeah, I mean, it actually does go back. Like, I mean, there are dams. There's there's stuff not far from me that that was put in place in late 1700s, 1800s, 1900s. Um, so it's, we think of the big ones that matter, like Susquehanna, um, you know, the Conowingo that was built in what, the 60s, I think, 50s? Yes. Um, so it all depends in, in what fishery we're talking about. And those are definitely points at which you impact the ability for that, that population of fish to kind of maintain the levels that, it, that it's at, at that time. Um, and so more recently, um, is more relevant, I guess. And if you look at any of the fishery population charts that I've pulled up now, it's really through the nineties and stuff that you saw this like flat line. And so it's not just the fact that the dam is there, the dam is one, one impediment, but you can go all over the Chesapeake Bay watershed in the spring and see tons of herring. Now I say tons, but how's that relate to hundred years ago? Nobody knows. Um, are, are they successful in spawning somewhere? Well, if they are, those little ones need grasses. They need the places to hide mm-hmm. and be able to grow up. Remember earlier I was talking about, we only think about the fish when we, like the adult river herring that's, you know, mm-hmm. what, 14, 14 inches long. We forget about that little guy. That little guy is probably feeding that two-year-old striped bass. Or, Jared, every episode yeah, I talk about or, grass, like aquatic vegetation, that we got to stop like dumping <laughs> gallons of pesticide and think about this. Like, and yeah. and I get like Odin Kirk, you're probably watching this right now. I get like you need to manage it, but it's a difference between managing it and basically like the dock owner that just never wants to see a blade of grass. Like, it's part of the ecosystem. It is needed. You. Need it was kind of like too. I saw. I don't know if you saw the Jeff Little. He posted. He was up on Susquehanna. Helicopter flies over. Now they were supposedly killing the gnats or flies or whatever, but it's kind of the same thing. I'm sitting there thinking, you know, as an angler, like you're talking about being outdoors, that kind of goes with the territory. Yep. And and that, again, you know, even though that's not in the water, those things land in the water, they're eating that stuff too. Those emerging flies and bugs. I mean, it's just, it's like, man, like we're, we're good for thinking that we can, like you were talking about mother nature, how we we're smarter than mother nature and we're going to introduce this or do this or kill that because we think it should be a certain way. And we don't realize the impact on the entire ecosystem and how, like you're talking about, it's all interrelated. Yep. And it's like we we're better off just to, to stay out of it. What from the standpoint of trying to fix things, uh, it's kind of like, I feel like we create our own messes. We create it, and then we're coming back now and trying to fix what we messed up, essentially. Yeah, and everything we do in in the end when it comes to fisheries management is talking about trade offs. Right. And it goes back to like, who gets the fish? Is it one person's fault or another? Well, it's all relative. Mm -hmm. I can sit here all day long and say that that shut down the commercial fishery and it would solve the straight bass's problem. Is that a fact? Maybe not. It all depends on the series of things that happen after this point. I mean, Mm -hmm. who knows? And it's your your deer on the wall. made me think of something as you were talking. Um, I've got a bunch of them over there. the whitetail story is interesting. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a success story of of conservation, depending mm-hmm. on where you are and who you're, who you're talking to. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. And if you think about, like, I think growing up in Howard County, which is suburban deer central, you know, it turns out that the whitetail thrives on edges and hedges mm-hmm. and backyards in suburbia. That's right. Um, and so their population went through the roof. We've depressed mm-hmm. their natural predators, um, generally speaking. Mm-hmm. And then now, all of a sudden, diseases come in and predators are coming back, but the number one predator is the, uh, the, the SUV. And, and so yeah. Yeah, if, if deer hunters want a high abundance of deer, like that immediately clashes with, with the rest of society, which actually created this opportunity for population growth. Right. 
And so like that keeps that keeps happening. And those stories are repeated across our country and in, in so many things. Well, that affect the I, I grew up in Loudoun County, like Middleburg. You're not allowed to, because of the Middleburg laws, which we call them because that's equine country and the fox, the fox rules. We don't have pheasants or bob whites anymore because, mm-hmm. you know, you can't hunt foxes unless you're from horseback. Mm-hmm. And that had a, a huge effect on that. My dad talked about growing up in Loudoun County back in the day, and there were tons of those those ground nesting birds, but mm-hmm. you can't find them anymore. Just to yeah. kind of piggyback on what you're saying with the deer. Yeah. yeah. And the same happened with the, the management. And I, and I agree with you because I kind of started in that with managing, you know, deer population and to, to what you can control and the research and that they in development that they the different states, Georgia was big in it um, to kind of educate us. But there were you had there was a shift in like what the old school way of thinking of, you know, specific deer was, well, don't shoot doe, shoot the bucks. Well, then the thought was, well, if you want bigger bucks, but the, the idea was does are going to give you more deer. But, right. you know, if you don't let that little buck get to the mature age, you're not going to see big bucks. And so there, there had to be a, a, a shift in, in mentality and thinking. And when that did take on, you, you started protecting the smaller buck. You could grow bigger bucks. And so, you know, back to your fishery, same type of thing of, you know, what can you manage? What can you control? And is it is it protecting, you know, a certain age class, like you're saying, that so that you can get that reproduction? Um, you know, it's a little bit different with fish, but it's the same concept of managing it to the point where uh, we're going to do what's best for the fish, the fishery, so that that resource, we are able to go out and enjoy it. Right. Jared, Jared, the, I would also say it's it's not the rule, like throwing a rule up. It's a culture shift. Right. Exactly. It, yes. It, it's Agreed. a culture 100%. shift for the common man. It's That's like, right. Think about, I saw on this, this random Florida, this guy posted, he was eating like five bass, legal size. Mm-hmm. The hate he had in that comment section was amazing. It was so yeah. healthy. <laughs> 30 years ago, though, if he did that, no one would think. And that's because right. in 30 years, we've changed the narrative and the culture on that. Yeah, and at the same time, that catch and release, I've heard too, where in some bodies of water, and it goes back to what you're saying, you've got to have a good baseline, good count of what you got, because you can also, it can be detrimental to a population in a given body of water. If you don't take out the 12 to 14 inches, let's say, and you have an overpopulation, there's only so many groceries in said, and that's back to the thing with with uh, you know, deer, there's only so many groceries. And so if you become overpopulated, you're going to stunt their growth too. So in some some areas, not all, it's independent, but some areas that catch and release was actually detrimental. Uh, same goes for your panfish that reproduce. You know, now granted that is also a food source, but um, you know, so it is, and it goes back to that balance. But you know, the biggest thing I think is so important too with with that, Thomas, and you're right about the culture is the education. Yeah, and that's what I love. What Dave's doing is it's he's, and if you listen to him, he's talk. He is searching for information and knowledge first and foremost, whether it be from the literature, from what he's seeing, reading online, but also talking to the professionals, the people that are out there. And he's informing himself before he goes out and educates other people. And that, that I think is so important. So what we've been fighting too, Thomas, is you got the wrong people that are trying to educate because they don't know, they don't know what this species is from this species. They don't know what they're talking about. And and they go out and they think that they're doing good because they're they think they're educated, but they're 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 not even accurate on what they're saying. So uh, there's an old adage that uh, a lie can make it around the world twice before the truth ever gets their shoes on. That's and right. It's not to say that people that want a certain outcome and say a certain thing um, that they've mm-hmm. been told or they want to repeat is a liar. Like it's not like that, mm-hmm. right? And but, it's not like it's ill intent either. They're not. There's no ill intention in what they're right. doing. They just are not considering again the ecosystem as a whole yeah so when you're talking you're making me i have a we're gonna have a little uh lesson here um <laughs> if uh if you zoom in there what that's showing is i mean it's labeled and this is the kind of stuff that i encourage people to look at and you're not going to get it the first time so i would encourage you to look at it read some more attend a meeting a lot of these all these atlantic states marine fisheries commission meetings are, are uh, live streamed hmm. um Hmm. There's an opportunity for public engagement, but I, I also, another hat I wear is um, I first was a pupil and now I'm a moderator and, and part of the steering committee of a program called the Marine Resource Education Program. And it's for fishermen, by fishermen. The whole focus is to educate people to engage in fisheries management. And that way they're informed. They understand a little bit of the science, a little bit of the management system, and they can spend their time 
engaging for an outcome that they want um, instead of just showing up at a meeting. And what we tell them in that process is if you're coming to the meeting, coming to the public microphone, and that's your first bite at the apple or your first chance to try and affect an outcome, um, unless you're with the majority that's already kind of made up their minds, that might you may not affect the outcome at that meeting. And and this this work, um, fisheries management, the work CCA does, we always say is a marathon, not a sprint. And uh, thankfully, it's a relay. <laughs> we we get to pass the baton to each other and uh, and work through it. But like so, for striped bass, um, this is um, part of the data uh, that that came out of the um, the 2018 stock assessment. And so. Uh, 2018 was the last time we assessed the stock coast wide. It was called a benchmark stock assessment. It's a massive document that's on that same website. Um, and, but it's really informative if you look back, uh, in, in the tables and the information I, and it shows some stuff I won't be able to pull up while we're on here, but, um, uh, just to show you this, um, ultimately this is a, a report out of the, the data and, and it shows through the last year of 2018, um, in this assessment, the, the, the last year was actually 2017, um, so I may be off here. But either way, this is estimates of, of removals um, or landings. Um, so we use these terms kind of, in, in, we switch back and forth, but um, removals is something that's been talked about a lot recently. Um, and that's because it's a combination of the four sources of mortality that are listed there in the, uh, in the legend. Um, and so commercial is landings and discards. A discard is when you have to throw the fish back. And that could be for any reason. It could be choice. You know, generally speaking, in a commercial fishery, it means that the fish is not the targeted species or not of legal size. Um, and so those discards are just shown in this graph um, in that combined in commercial landings. And the reason that you see the consistency across the commercial fishery is that's when the quota allowed that that harvest. Um, the the quota has been adjusted for various reasons and and more recently because of a population decline. Um, the same thing with recreational landings. The reason you see recreational landings, the blue section um, kind of downward trend in recent years is there have been two different efforts to reduce uh, removals or fishing mortality. Um, first by by uh, 20 and a half percent and more recently by 18 percent. Um, and it was actually 25 percent on the coast, 20 and a half percent in the bay. Uh, a while back. But anyway, a big focus recently is relates to what you're talking about with catch and release. Um, and you see the yellow portion of the of the bar. Um, and so what this is adding up is dead fish. The yellow portion there, gold portion there, um, that's actually equivalent to 9% of the number of fish that they think we caught and released. And that's kind of what it says in the fine print right there at the bottom. So if you went out there, they think we you caught 100 fish, the management system is going to assume that nine of them died. And so the discard or release mortality from the recreational fishery is that 9% um, of total live releases. Now, this data is a coastwide assessment for the coastwide 365 day a year fishery. Doesn't mean you can legally kill a striped bass somewhere 365 days. I think you actually can, um, or you used to be able to. Um, but ultimately, somebody can go and catch and maybe have to release a striped bass 365 days a year. And so that go kind of goes back to my point about the population density of where these fish live. Um, so we've impacted their rivers. We've talked about their habitat the degradation. I mean, we're not done with that story in the Chesapeake. Um, we we'll definitely want to get back to that. But ultimately, this is where we where we stand. And so managers, after we do it, look back and say, what do we think happened? And then if you go down to the next graph, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about goals and how we have these trade-offs. If you just scroll down. Right there. Keep on going. There we go. Oh, so that's a good one. So it says female spawning stock, biomass, and recruitment. So the big blob is what we're talking about first. Um, the acronym SSB, spawning stock, biomass. Um, this is our manager's. Um, and the modeling that's done over time estimates the population. And every time the assessment is updated, some of the numbers are updated. And so our understanding of the population size and everything about it might be different today than it was a decade ago as far as the actual number. And that has actually happened with straight bass. I'm not going to go into that. It's kind of a technical thing. Um, but that's important to understand. Because if you were to look at data from a quite a while ago, you might see that the estimated level um, 
is way more fish now than it used to be. Um, and that's something that happened more recently with the assessment. But what's important to talk about is the the target and then the threshold. So the, the solid line at the top and then the dotted line below that. So what happened coming out of the moratorium in, the, in about 1990, um, managers said, you know, we're going to start opening the fishery. Well, one of the tools they use, those lines, the, the target is pretty intuitive. The target is the thing you want to hit. The threshold in this case is the thing you do not want to go below as far as the population is concerned. And so if you look at 1995, that's the year at which the fishery was declared rebuilt, meaning that it was now above the threshold again. It didn't stay there long, kind of dipped back down again and then went back up, got up to the target, hit the target barely, and then declined ever since. And so the target is the goal. It's the goal of spawning stock biomass that, that management has said they want to achieve. And for a decade, they've been arguing that the goal is too high. And so for us, you know, so a group that represents recreational anglers that, that thrives on abundance of a resource, we've said, no, that's where we want you to get. We want, mm -hmm. we want the 2004 to seven era of population and fishing excitement to last as long as possible. And mm -hmm. the reality is nature can't do that, but we want that. That's mm -hmm. what we want. So that should be the goal that we set. So a lot of people have said, like, we want to keep this high target. Um, on the more practical side of things, if if the goal is to truly hit the target, then I think history and these 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 um, estimates and then observations kind of compiled into this this model that produces this information. Um, history tells us that we didn't hit it, and maybe a, a lower level is 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 where we need to be. But ultimately, that threshold was set at the 1995 estimated biomass. That's what we decided was our threshold. We don't want to go lower than the 1995 biomass ever again. And then the target was set at 25% higher. So 125% of the of the, what we thought was great. Um, and in the end, this is what's happening in just about any resource that's, that's a renewable resource. We're going, what percent of what's out there can we take so that they can continue to reproduce and maintain a population above a certain level. And if you want to go back to deer real quick, guess what? The population level for a hunter that they want is going to be way higher than what that insurance company wants. Mm -hmm. or, you know, folks that are trying to grow a garden in their backyard. That same thing exists in every single natural resource, public resource debate. And it, it's push and pull. And it, that could vary person to person, state to state, you know, user to group to user group. And that's why we're very fortunate in this country to have this process that we can dig into. It is complicated. It is very um, burdensome and frustrating, but we're also very fortunate to have groups like CCA and many others that have continually led the sportsman community through these issues. And 99.9% .9 of the time always said what's best for that animal, what's best for their habitat, what's best for their resource and how do we tackle this as a community? So, I mean, that's my favorite part of my job is the people I get to rub elbows with. And the, the coalitions that we're part of that that help shape this stuff because there's very few other groups out there that are stepping up to say we want to create a Chesapeake invasives count to help you understand snakeheads. The the natural reaction is that people just argue about whether they're good or bad. Mm -hmm. You know, there's very few people that say like we want to do research and and you know give up our farm to do some research on whitetail habits like like so many people have done. The mm -hmm. work partnership with Game and Fish. And then also it's just a matter of stepping up to pay for it. I mean, we are the community that pays through, for it through excise taxes, through license fees, uh, through stamps. Um, you know, we're the ones that continue to pay for conservation of our resources. So when it, I'm, I'm, where I'm going with this is when it comes back down to commercial versus recreational, that's why some of these issues are so difficult is we, the public, you know, we expect better and not just like somebody to make make a you know financial gain necessarily out of a resource that we should all be able to access in some way. I got a question and, and you know, how much because I'm thinking too, like and I noticed in our in our small body of water, like the fish behavior has changed. Like fish have moved mm -hmm. when, when the grass was taken out. Their behavior changed when they went after food and, and your resource. You're talking about Chesapeake Bay. You're talking about a vast, vast area of water. Or in, in this data is good. Um, this data represents what what you like, and you've alluded to this. What you know, mm -hmm. um, what, there's a lot out there that we don't know. And I guess, and 
it does still go back to catch rates because if your recreational fishing fishermen are going out and they're not catching, they're not happy, they're not satisfied. Mm-hmm. I'm just curious as to if if how much of it is just changing fish behavior. Well, I'd also like to add to that, Jared, two things, which would be like the Clean Air Act of the 1990s um, mm-hmm. that that went underway. And also, what are, is the data say about the amount of licensed anglers? Because I know, I mean, Jared, from Jake's Bait and Tackle, like with COVID, like there was a boom mm-hmm. in the amount of people that went out and went fishing, which is mm-hmm. from one side, we think that's good, which it is. But mm-hmm. then the other side is like, there's more people at the lake. So like, mm-hmm. what is the progression amount of people that fished from the 19th? That's a good thing? point. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, I think it's the thing is like, it's a death by a thousand cuts. It's never one thing mm-hmm. that, that does this. Yeah. Like I said, I've been, I've said a couple of times recently, you know, people want to point the finger, then you better break out all 10. Yeah, and and break it, take your shoes off too, because even then you don't have enough to point. Um, mm-hmm. And pointing is kind of an exercise in futility anyway. But um, so we don't know what we don't know. Uh, the whole point of science is to try and understand and and kind of narrow down what, what we don't know, <laughs> or you know, cut away some things we don't know and try and have some have a a better understanding of it. Um, so there's no question that if an available habitat does not exist, then a, a species cannot thrive its mm-hmm. carrying capacity um even with like an invasive species you see massive growth over over initial periods whatever that might be um and then they'll they'll peak and then they'll get down into what they call like an equilibrium position um and that's in a closed system you know the the variables that come in in a place like Chesapeake Bay like you said are so massive mm-hmm. it's insane 11,664 miles of shoreline something like that Wow. Um, think about that. And the average depth's like 15 feet across wow. the whole thing, or even less. Mm-hmm. So I, I put this here to pull up because this is an important thing that 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 exact kind of conversation happens. Be like, you know, it's like where'd they go? Did they move? Are they in a different place? And this is this is data that comes out of um the juvenile striped bass index. So like we're literally right now, there's teams from Maryland DNR, Virginia. Um, as well, going around the Chesapeake Bay, and there's there's a bunch of there's four different spots on the on the coast that that look at this data. Um, the Hudson River does it, and then uh, Delaware Bay as well. Um, so the um, there may be one more survey up in New England because um, the Chesapeake is one of the four. Um, but ultimately, this is Maryland's section, and so Maryland has this is striped bass. Maryland has the Choptank River, the Nanticoke River, the Susquehanna, but all, really it's the Chesapeake Bay below the Susquehanna Flats. Um, and some of the, the rivers right there um, have minor spawning areas, but the main spawning area is really like Pools Island north, you know, up to the southern edge of the flats. Um, and then you have the Potomac. Those are the major Maryland producers for striped bass. So throughout those waterways and then others, uh, the team from DNR goes out with a standardized net. They do a swept area survey. It's a sane net, with lead on the bottom, corks on top. I want to say it's six feet tall. Hmm. Um, maybe it's four feet Um Gotcha. A pole on each end, and what they do is they sweep the beach, and mm. sometimes they'll catch some SAV. Sometimes they'll, you know, every time they'll catch something. Um, I, I actually did it with them uh, because this is a, another kind of cool part. Even before I worked for CCA, um, before I worked for CCA, I had an opportunity just to kind of volunteer with some free time, and I, I've been out on various surveys with the folks at DNR, and I've been on this one so. Um, they sweep the net, you pull it in, you've got a whole bunch of young of year, um, which is another way we, we call the juvenile index, the young of year or YOY survey. And you count what you what you caught. Um, I remember a day up off of uh, like literally Tolchester Beach, right at the Tiki Bar, right by the marina, Tolchester's straight east of Baltimore in, in Kent County. Um, we swept the net and we pulled up a little spot. We pulled up a little white perch, little Menhaden, little river herring. Um, some of uh, the, some, um, silver sides, some striped bass, they measure those striped bass. They take a couple scales, put it in a envelope because by looking at a scale, you can guarantee the, or you can compare them to others and basically understand the length or the age of the fish. Mm-hmm. Um, and then by length, you know, you should guess that the fish is a certain length. Mm-hmm. So there's something like 42 areas that they do that at and count all the fish and then add them together. That gives them a way to compare every single year with the next. Hmm. So that makes it an index. An index is a comparison of one thing to another. It's done in a, in a structured way. So every single year we've done this survey. And you see in the late 70s or really 70s and 80s, you can see poor recruitment down mm-hmm. in that area. 
Um, so the black line is just the average. Hmm. And this also kind of shows you that once every couple of years, mm -hmm. they're going to have a good spawn. Right. So we've observed those real high spikes in striped bass population. It doesn't mean that that is a guarantee. So that gets the like whether fish are in a spot year after year. And some people say that anecdotally, they're based on their experience, they're seeing plenty of striped bass and that the decline is not what the data shows. I've heard mm -hmm. that for a decade. Hmm. Um, I've generally heard that from people who were less likely to agree that, um, or th that may have a different interest in the fishery than I do. Right. Um, it's, it's always an argument that's a means to an end. Well, mm -hmm. the data is wrong because of this is what I saw and you're wrong, but it mm -hmm. just happens that person makes a living off the fishery too. So yeah, and they don't want to regulate it. Right. Yeah. And I can respect that. I mean, I get that. Right. But, but ultimately, so what we're looking at here is, is, is that phenomenon. This is the data used versus the anecdotal experience. We're always going to have that. We're always going to have that disconnect and nobody's ever going to know the exact answer. Mm -hmm. And so to me, the trends are the most valuable because they're not that exact point of, I saw this, therefore it is. And therefore it is everywhere else. Right. It's the trends through surveys like this that to me are more valuable because it's not just that one person saying what they saw. Right. So these things are always going to change. And then there's the greater, the greater climate, the greater, you know, weather environment that's happening that, that we can observe and, say you know things are different now than they were before things are changing more quickly now than ever before but all that i mean we see as a country like how complicated you know climate discussions can be mm -hmm. whether people want to believe in something or not and, and right. so on and so forth but it actually in, in in fisheries there's this concept called the um the multi-decadal oscillation of the oceans so they've actually seen these oscillations in ocean currents and temperatures and activity and they've been able to see trends in certain fish species based on that. And if you talk to any old timer, they will tell you that like a croaker, you know, popular bottom fish, um, great to eat, hard fighting. They're fun. They would tell you that, that, you know, they remember in their lifetime when there were none and then they were everywhere. Right. Now there's none again. Exactly. So, you know, it, it adds um, uncertainty in this whole thing. And, I think anybody that's professionally involved in this management process can can respect that. Excuse me, respect that and, and understand that we don't know everything. It almost speaks to a cycle too that I often believe in or hear about is yeah. things will peak and then they're going to fall off, and it just it's just a cycle. And, you're, yeah. and a lot of populations show that. Um, yep, yep. Yeah. And I always tell people I went to the science center recently with my three and a half year old. And we were looking at dinosaur stuff, and they have this like timeline, right? Mm -hmm. And they're showing like what existed when, and I'm sitting here going, "Hey, I didn't know there were so many different dinosaurs until I had a kid." And B, I'm going, "Huh? <laughs> that one didn't live when that one did lived, and huh? I thought they right. were all together. Like, what happened right. to Jurassic Park? You know?" And uh, and it's just mind numbing. Though, but though, it, this gives you a good a good chance to realize how small we are, right? Um, in in time and history, mm -hmm. um, but also we we're impactful. I mean, there's no question what we've done in parts of our planet is just crazy. And you see the impact to the things that we hold near and dear, like fish. I mean, the dams are a good example of that in this little window of time. So I don't know. Overall, though, what is the strike? Because you're thinking, like, we have the guys you don't know, the Chesapeake Bay. I think it's the Hudson River, the Delaware River, and there's one more up in Maine that are the major spawning areas yeah, on Kennebec, the East Coast. I think. Yeah. Kennebec, okay. Yeah, yeah. What is the data? Like, I mean, I'm not telling you to pull this out of your butt tonight, but like, yeah. is it is it everywhere's down on the East Coast or is it just Maryland? Because that would really support the hypothesis of climate change or, or there's something about just the bay. Or is it literally all the all the estuaries are down in the striped bass population? So I don't know the exact like juvenile index where elsewhere, yeah. you know, where it happens elsewhere. I do know that Maryland's technique is different than Virginia's. Um, but in general, um, I don't know the spawning data is, is really the answer to that for those other systems. But in general, um, the biomass and kind of the center of that of the fishery, depending on time of year, has definitely shifted to the north. And there's plenty of other fish species that have rapidly shifted to the north over my involvement in fisheries management. Um, it was basically 15 plus years now. Um, uh, sea bass is one of them. 
they're on every little rock outcropping all throughout Cape Cod and have been for a decade plus. And I mean, catching black sea bass from shore with a popper, like who would think? Mm -hmm. um, and management couldn't catch up with that. I mean, they're all of a sudden it's like, wait, all right, well, we know they're there, but we have this federal law which manages them because they exist in federal waters um, mm -hmm. outside three miles. It, and it talk about a complicated thing. And then, um, so flounder, same thing, scup, same thing, you know, cod, there's, there's fisheries that are disappearing to the north or just disappearing altogether because at least in the abundance that we want, because the conditions don't allow it. And striped bass, like in the nineties, um, in the wintertime, Virginia beach and South, even down to as far as like Hatteras and further, um, had striped bass, which is kind of crazy to think that that a fish like the striped bass would really break through the Gulf Stream and get below Hatteras, but they're there mm -hmm. um, because that's that's a major um, border. You know, the the um, Labrador current comes from the north; it's the cold current moving south. The Gulf Stream is going up up to the to, to the north. They hit at Hatteras, making that hard break, and why, that's why it's so you know the fishing so great in the Outer Banks. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, I always found that amazing. But so North Carolina has always had a, a reproducing population of striped bass in its rivers um, in Albemarle Sound. Um, and they believe now that that those fish are like separate from the whole population, the mm -hmm. coastal population, separate mm -hmm. genetically. And so I don't know if that's, you know, being a southern place, if that is a kind of like the canary in the coal mine, essentially. And now the Chesapeake's next where striped bass success because of the prevailing environment um, mm. is just not going to be what it has been over history. Is it going to make a turn? Um, but again, anecdotally, like the folks that there's really great data on the genetics of striped bass. And if I'm not mistaken, it's the Chesapeake stock, whether they're from Maryland or Virginia, that kind of beeline straight to Massachusetts and further north. Mm. And so I know that folks in like Maine, New Hampshire, um, CCA folks up there for years we're saying that they can see the impact on their striped bass fishery as things shifted out of North Carolina and shifted and started to change in the Chesapeake. So like they could feel the pain in the past, but the folks in the middle there, like Jersey, Raritan Bay, Hudson River, Long Island Sound, all the way out to the Cape, like basically out to Rhode Island, they almost thrive off like the Hudson fishery or the Hudson stock. And the Hudson stock has been doing better as that river has been cleaned up drastically. So there's also been a whole piece in 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 um, in Canada where there's massive striped bass populations now in rivers with Atlantic salmon. Hmm. And, and wow. yeah, that's so interesting to me because you're dealing with something that like I can like just the things evolve, things change. And I and I keep hearing that there's more there's more trout and there's more redfish in the bay than it have been in a while, which is mm -hmm. typically a warm water species. And it, is this just the tea leaves telling us like this is where it's gonna go? That maybe what was a great striped bass fishery is now, I mean, there's tarpon now more, more or less mm -hmm. like quote unquote that we're seeing now. So is that just the tea leaves saying like, we're just going to have this different influx of different species now as things change and we just need to adapt. I think in our lifetime, maybe, um, but it's not the first time. Necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the history as well as I wish I did. And maybe we don't haven't written it down. Not, not the level of management that we've been showing tonight on the screen. Um, but there's no doubt that, um, well, I mean, there's red drum have been caught in Long Island before. You know, there's a, it could be a freak thing that that happened. Um, I don't know with how much regularity, um, but it's pretty simple. I mean, a, a population of fish can fill a certain area mm -hmm. based on numbers of animals, right? And so if the numbers of animals increase, they're going to continue to expand their range. Mm -hmm. That's not always the case. They could just expand their range because of prevailing habitat situation and then food. Um, but in general, the, the, Think of the redfish. So I want to, you know, it's the early 80s that they were taken care of in the Gulf. And um, if you guys are familiar with the purse seine fishery, that's where a big ship carries a bunch of little little boats on the back, usually two, maybe one. Um, the big ship goes out, drops the tender boat. The tender boat has a net connected to it and does a big circle around the school. They cinch up the bottom of the net and then pull it up against the big ship and the big ship unloads the catch. Hmm. And that was actually used for big red drum in the Gulf back in the day when there was a commercial fishery for big red drum. Um, so you had these giant fish that were swimming around, you know, 30 pounds to let's say 20 to 50 pound fish. Brood stock, yeah. The brood stock, they like striped bass start spawning at about 
age five through age eight, nine or so, by the time all of them are, are sexually mature. And if you've seen pictures of what's happening in the lower Chesapeake, and has been for some time, um, they're packed together. It's like the water turns gold. So you've got a plane flying around looking for fish. They call the boat over, the boat circles the fish and then sucks them right up. Hmm. And that was happening in the Gulf. So there is a genetic difference between Gulf red drum and the, the Atlantic red drum. But it's just, there's got to all of a sudden, you know, if you get an abundance of fish, it's got to spill over eventually and start migrating. Mm -hmm. uh, every animal does that. I mean, every animal, a lot of times, actually the, the extent, the furthest extent of their range is typically the biggest in fish. So it, it's kind of cool that in the Chesapeake, we kind of have the Northern extent of red drum right now. Um, cause we're getting really big ones. We actually have bigger ones here than they, than they catch in the Gulf in, in many cases. Um, but anyway, um, those populations could only expand if the prevailing conditions exist for them, mm -hmm. right? So it's there's got to be something happening that allows them to be here. So let's talk to that. You've talked a lot about habitat, and we were at ICAST. You had some really cool structures uh, that you all create, I guess, or make, yep, manufacture, whatever. Um, and you can kind of kind of talk to that, and like, and I imagine that's something. Once you put it down there, you're able to go down and 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 survey it to see if it's is it working like how is that you know yeah. how are you how are you improving habitat and and is it working is that something uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking around my office right now because i usually have a little reef ball on a shelf that's what we're talking about i'm gonna go grab one real quick and yeah. show it to you yeah thomas this is you know it's just it continues to amaze me um you know we're learning more and more about the resource as a whole and uh it's funny because yeah. like I've had so many people say when I started this, like no one wants to do hear this stuff. They want to hear about the fish catches. And it's like, yeah, we're going to be the NPR of, of the outdoors mm -hmm. because people actually do have a thirst for this because I do mm -hmm. feel like there is a disconnect between the local state governments and their ability to get information out there. And I saw this. Well, I think too. Yeah. Well, like we're, we're going to look at it and say, we're going to blame the state and say, well, you're not doing this. You're not doing that. Or you're doing this or whatever, but it's kind of like, we got to look in the mirror too. And like, he's talking about finger pointing. Like, what can we, what are we doing to negatively impact it? But now we're switch, switching gears and saying, you know, what can we do to, to have a positive influence mm -hmm. on the resource? Yep. And, and to set the stage, I believe these are artificial reefs that, that you actually brought down to ICAST that you also use them to help actually grow the, the other thing that we haven't talked about yet, which is the oysters that are on the yep. bay, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Yep. So 100%. So yeah, what you had the image of, and then this is a little model. Um, this is actually one with a plaque on it for one of our school partners. Um, but this is a model of a reef ball. This is made by the reef ball foundation. In fact, that artwork behind me now, um, that's actually some artwork done by one, one of our local board members here in CCA, Maryland. Um, the idea is that from habitat equals fish. So our mantra at CCA, I was talking earlier about how, you know, we're an advocacy organization at our core, but, um, realize that you can only set rules and regulations for so long to affect the outcomes we want. Um, we have to roll up our sleeves. We have to invest in the future of our habitat. Uh, and in the Chesapeake, the oyster is, is king. Um, I'd say king, queen, prince, and princess. <laughs> um, they're very important. Um, and they're not the only important thing, but from oysters can come so many other things. So what a reef ball is doing is it was originally designed to, to be able to propagate uh, coral habitat because that's a whole other can of worms. But the coral reef of the Chesapeake is, is the oyster. Um, and so reef balls have been deployed in, in Maryland uh, for about 20 plus years. I think I want to say it's about 2000, was about, I think the first time, maybe 2003. Um, but ultimately, um, they're a tool. I mean, they're an artificial reef unit. There's a lot of ways to build reefs um, for a long, long time. Uh, reefs have been materials of opportunity. They still are um, a ship. I was on a, a destroyer that's off of um, it's equidistant from Jersey, Delaware and Maryland. Uh, 593 foot destroyer called the Radford. Um, I don't know if it's that long. Anyway, it's long. Um, got to get on that ship and see it. I mean, they, the, a crew in the Philly Naval Yard was tearing all the stuff off of it to make sure there's no PCBs and chemicals and stuff. And so that's something we do, right? We use the oceans to get rid of some stuff. And if we do it right, it can create habitat for fish. It can create a fishing location. Hmm. Um, so a ton of that work has been done by CCA and so many partners around the, around the country. Uh, and really around the world. In fact, I think reef balls are used in like 60 plus countries. Um, the idea is that they're made out of a out of a fiberglass mold. So, you know, this is obviously just the model, but 
most of what we build, you'd have three pieces that go around the outside that are a fiberglass mold. It sits on a plywood base. It's connected to the plywood base. And then inside of it to make the holes is um, a rubber buoy. So like, like the, the big orange buoy, you know, they use for floats on Deadliest Catch. Um, that's what's called a polyform buoy. That actually goes on the inside, makes the inside hole. And then the holes around the outside are made by a series of rubber balls that get stuck in the mold. Um, and so what we did, you know, we didn't, weren't the first to build reef balls, won't be the last, but, but when CCA Maryland reached a point where we went, you know, we really need to dig in and do some more habitat work. Um, that was a point at which we became um, a partner with the state for the artificial reef program. And so we help, we help administer the funds for the artificial reef program in the state of, in, in Maryland, in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and then we work with uh, the Ocean City Reef Foundation um, on the coast to build reefs there as well. And, and kind of revitalized that uh, at a time when um, we were volunteering to support um, an increase in license fees. So we went, hey, DNR, you're not getting done what we want you to get done. They say, oh, well, we don't have the budget. And we say, well, let's go, let's get together and work through a series of things. And I'm way oversimplifying it. Um, but ultimately, the outcome was we want a more robust habitat program that recreational anglers can get behind a, a reef program. So I was about, I think, 07, 08 was when that happened. Um, so ultimately, ever since then, CCA has, has held the dollars for the state reef fund, but we don't take any. We don't take any administrative fee. Um, and so that kind of puts me squarely in a place where we can do a lot of good work by working with the department and working with a lot of other partners. So um, following the reef ball model, seeing what was done in this state by other groups, um, uh, other different fishing groups that, that aren't around anymore had done some of this work, um, where people were actually going to schools and working with kids and having the kids in like a tech center or a high school program uh, build reef balls. Then they would work with the state or whoever uh, to put them out in a location in the bay. And those locations in the bay are heavily scrutinized. Um, they are because the bay is public, because the bottom is public, and because it's navigable water, uh, you have DNR, MDE, and Department of the Environment. Um, you have the Corps of Engineers. Um, there's some federal oversight in case of impacts to invasive uh, or uh, 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 impacts to marine mammals or um, uh, endangered species because they're federally protected. Um, and so there's all this alphabet soup. And ultimately, they say, okay, you can have this spot on the bottom. And here are all the rules and you get what's called a tidal wetlands permit and a box and folks look at their chart. You'll, you'll see it. It's it, throughout the Chesapeake Bay. There's spots that say fish haven, uh, authorized fish haven, clearance, 15 feet, clearance, eight feet. Um, those things are spots. So with all this potential opportunity to build reef back in the Bay in 2017, we kicked off the living reef action campaign. And so that's kind of our newest iteration in what we do to build reefs. That's building reef balls with schools. Uh, that was started in Westminster, Maryland at their Masonry Tech Center, um, which is cool because you have kids going that, you know, they sure as heck don't want to be sitting through, you know, English class. They're learning a skill. They're working with their hands. They're working with a skilled teacher. And now they're building fish habitat. I mean, I got to say real quick, you know, that's what I love about private enterprise. Like, like where when somebody told you no, we don't have the resources. We don't have the money. Like great entrepreneurs and, and private enterprise, no is not the answer. And yep. what can we do? Who can we pull? What resource can we pull? And then you, you just created a huge, you know, community project to help the fishery. And that's to me, like that's what it's all about. I mean, it's it's incredible. It's incredible what you're capable of doing when you have the personality that you have, and just to be able to again reach out and. And you're making it happen. That's that's awesome. Well, and it's it's what they say. I think it was a Warren Buffett quote where uh, somebody, or I guess we stand in the shade of a tree somebody planted a long time ago. That's right. Yep. And now we've gotten it right, and it's close. And that's yeah, CCA's no, story. Yep. I mean, the folks that got together in 1977 said we're going to do something better, and we're going right. to hold ourselves to this standard for many years, and we have ever since. And mm -hmm. you know, I picked up the ball and ran with it. You know, from mm -hmm. people that have been doing this work for so long, and. Not a single thing I do, I couldn't do without our members, without our partners. And the amount of investment that happens on public, private, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, most of the vast, vast, vast majority of our funding is, is from our members and That's from awesome. you know, their companies and stuff. And, you know, so we started this program in Carroll County and in, 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 you know, so 17 was the first year we went mobile with fourth graders. Wow. Um, so we inherited some molds that were purchased from, from another grant. 
they were sitting literally mothballed. I mean, sitting in a storage container somewhere. Um, so we work with those partners, work through all the agreements, got them, put them mobile, put them in an enclosed trailer, wrapped it with obscene. It showed the underwater so we could kind of take something that's out of sight and out of mind and bring it, you know, right there for the kids to see. Mm-hmm. And then we tell the story of, of oysters. And what when when we were in schools doing it, you know, full time, I, I really, like I said, I started, I'm sorry, it's 2015 the program started. I got the, the date wrong. Um, 2017 is when I started running it. And um, at that time, we'd spread out amongst Carroll County. We were hitting other places, first come, first serve, as soon as we could. Uh, we built in Northern Virginia. Um, and then when I when I took over as director, you know, I built these opportunities to make changes. And I said, you know, this program has to grow. Mm-hmm. It has to be with what we lead with. And mm-hmm. I love nothing more than standing up in front of people and saying, this is my favorite program because it's selfish. Because we're going to build a habitat and habitat's going to lead to more fish. And that means I'm going to be more successful. And heck, I might even eat them. <laughs> so like, that's it, right? Why not take care of something that you have been given dominion over and, and can take care of? And so I think uh, we're up to like 13 jurisdictions in Maryland. Um, we've worked in a couple in Virginia. And um, I don't know the exact number that we've built. But throughout the Bay, um, in fact, there's I think there's about 130 of them sitting on the land right now um, to go in the Magothy River. Um, and that's probably the smallest water body that we put them on in in the bay, the smallest river, um, you know, right between Pasadena and um, Severna Park and then down into Arnold. Um, we So I got a, I got a call in like January of, of 21 um, from one of our partners and they said, hey, we're putting the reef in the water tomorrow. And I'm like, what? Like we're in the middle of COVID. There's a surge again. Nobody knows what's going on. I'm like, you're doing what? They're like, yeah, we need a banner. Can you meet us? So I drove down to the Marine contractor's house, McGuire Marine. Um, And you're like, yeah, man, we're putting the reef balls out tomorrow. I'm like, do you need a contract, a check, uh, anything? He goes, no, I'm just doing it. I got a day in my schedule. My guys aren't building any docks right now. Like we're going to load up the reef balls in the morning. We'll get them in the water by night. So Legally, he was good. Yet there was a permit in place. He's a licensed and, and authorized marine contractor. The state's involved. A whole bunch of press. And literally in January, middle of winter, they pushed a barge out with 100 plus reef balls on it. And he set up a uh, a work barge perpendicular to the main barge. Used his excavator. Would tie a line through every single reef ball and drop it down to the bottom. Let go of the one side. Pull it back through. And there's a Garmin or no hummingbird hummingbird side scan um, from a friend Nick Garrett with Sonar Pros or Sonar Kings. Um, he did a side scan of this of this reef site, and all 100 are in this perfect little grid. That's so cool. Yeah, and the, the Mike <laughs> the contractor is like, dude, what do you think? I'm like, what do I think? You couldn't have put them in more more you know better. And what's cool is they're all they're sitting against each other as best we can you know can line them up. And there are volunteers from throughout the entire Magothy River that grow oysters in cages on their docks. And so they get oysters as, as spat or small seed oysters. They take care of them throughout the year. They clean the cages, they power wash them off. They make sure that these oysters can grow. And then at the end of the year, they all get together and put them out in the river. Well, they're putting them out on top of these reef balls now. Mm. So what a reef ball does is create three dimensionality. Oyster reefs used to do that. In the 1600s, when John Smith came up the bay, you know, his log books talk about the hazard to navigation and what the oyster rocks and oyster reefs look like. And it wasn't until really mechanized dredging and, and uh, steam power and that kind of stuff really gave us the ability to totally destroy it, hmm. totally destroy it. So post-Civil War, we went out into the bay um, and just completely destroyed the oyster resource. To the, and it was already happening up in New England. Um there were guys coming down from up there to come to the Chesapeake to take the Chesapeake oysters because they were available. And it's, you know, they call these, these stories in, in natural resource failures, you know, tragedy of the commons. And it's because there's this thing at the bottom of the bay that to people it's food. And if you think of like post-war America, nobody was thinking like, what is this animal's role in the ecosystem? Hell, people don't even think about that today. Right. Um, but ultimately what we took away was the ability for the bay to filter itself. And so if we go back to where we were talking about earlier and about water quality, meaning what's in it, um, when you have a nutrient outflow like the Baltimore water or sewage treatment plant that continuously fails, you're sending nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus into the waterways, which fuel 
everybody knows that if you look at your fertilizer bag that you pour on your grass, which is ridiculous, grow wildflowers. Um, like we all have these green grass because we fuel it with nitrogen and phosphorus. Well, grass is a plant. It thrives on those nutrients. Algae is a plant. Algae is in the water. You bright sun. And then these nutrients lead to algae blooms. Mm -hmm. Algae at first, actually, just like all plants, gives off oxygen. So it can be a good thing until it dies. It dies, falls to the bottom, decomposes, and actually removes oxygen from the system. So what an oyster is supposed to eat is the algae and, and some other things that are floating around in the waterways. Uh, and so if we had our good filtering capacity, like a, a level that we had pre-Civil War, maybe the bay would be healthier and all these fish stocks and everything else could succeed. So are we going to get back to that point? No. Um, unfortunately, we still have policies in place that allow harvest of wild oysters. Um, and we've failed to come up with a management system that works for my needs or our needs as a, as a community. Um, I actually, the whole other hat I wear, in fact, tomorrow night, I'll be on the Oyster Advisory Commission meeting at this time. Um, um, but ultimately, we're using this public resource that is an edible thing that somebody can take, we can sell, we can eat it. But it also happens to be the thing that cleans our waterways. Mm. Not the only thing, but one of the many things. So what we've basically done and what we do when working with the kids, it's not about what's right or wrong. Harvest it. It's not waterman versus environmental versus commercial. I mean, it's not all these these uniforms we can wear. What we do when we talk to the kids about habitat is get down to the basics, and we do talk a little bit about history because we want them to be well informed. And you know, the first time in history that that the concept of the public trust or a public resource was really talked about was with the Emperor Justinian, uh, and I want to say it was like the year five twenty four or something like that. And he's believed to have said that the seas, the, the shores of the sea, the waters and the air is common to everyone. Um, and that's the same concept that was carried on into English common law and the Magna Carta. And then as an English colony, um, we followed that same concept in, in establishing environmental law in the United States. It's the public trust doctrine, the public trust concept that the public entrusts our government to manage these these resources uh, for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, oysters are one of their major failures and um, their major failures. Um, like I said, this isn't to be anti-commercial because I'm not in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. It's not the industry's fault for following the rules. That right. Are presented, right? Yeah. But we can't get ourselves out of this cycle because the people in charge of regulating see somebody that makes a living rightfully so, mm -hmm. and says, how do I balance all this? Mm -hmm. And then we go back to all the stuff we we're talking about with fish about, you know, you can't see them, they move, et cetera. Well, oysters, at least they don't move. Um, but one thing that happened is, is, has nothing to really do with the harvest necessarily. And that is the, as the, the health of the Chesapeake Bay continued to go down, part of that's because we removed its filter. And then at the same time, we're impacting the, the, the health of the waterway by you know, really no rules and regs until the EPA stepped in. And even that's still back and forth. Um, and so we basically dug ourselves a hole we haven't come up out of. And to, to get back to why, why we're, we're building these reefs, it's to replace many, many, many years of growth, three-dimensional growth. And uh, you know, we call it the Living Reef Action Campaign because – so one of the first reef deployments we did uh, was at the Tillman Island Reef, which is just west of, the, of Tillman Island, just south of Poplar Island in the, in the middle portion of Maryland's Bay. Um, that was done with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation in, in I think, 2016. Hmm. And we actually set the reef balls in, a, in tanks of water at their oyster um, restoration facility that they have in Shadyside, Maryland. Um, they've actually just closed it down to, to go into somewhere else. But... Um, we would stack reef balls in these tanks, get hatchery reared oyster larvae from the University of Maryland um, Horn Point Lab in Cambridge, because we do, you know, hatchery for shellfish is, is very successful. Um, we would take oysters before they reach their attaching stage. Um, so they're still, I think they call them ped villagers, meaning they've grown a foot and they're like swimming around still, if I got that right. Um, we call oysters spat um, as well. And what they do is for the first like two weeks of their life, sperm and egg meet in the water column. These bad boys float around with the tide 
Uh, there's some studies that show that they're actually attracted to the noise that an oyster reef makes or maybe some other chemistry that they give off. Hmm. Um, and so they actually try and attach to an existing reef. Well, you've probably heard that the population's, you know, 1% of historical levels. You know, it all depends where you start that historical level number to get you a percentage. But bottom line is the abundance of oysters throughout the bay is just so limited. It's not funny. So unfortunately, that little spat doesn't have somewhere to attach. Well, we get it from the hatchery and we reproduce what nature, we, we guarantee their success as best we can. Mm -hmm. We take the spat, we put it into a tank of water that's been conditioned by temperature. We, we do this when the salinity is right, the temperature is right. Uh, the reef balls are in the water. Uh, the concrete reef balls have been aged for at least six months, typically longer, to allow them to completely cure and there, there be no um, like pH instability. Um, and so the, the baby oysters actually attached to that reef ball. And on some of the first ones we did, we, we got somewhere between about 1,000 and 1,500 uh, spat attached to about a 325-pound reef ball. Wow. We, yeah, we deployed uh, 72 of them on the first trip to Tillman Reef. Um, since then, we put out 388 in total. Um, but that's why we call it the Living Reef Action Campaign. We're not just taking scraps. We're not taking old ships. Um, you know, that stuff has its place. But in the Chesapeake, we want to rebuild as best we can three-dimensional reefs in as many places as possible. And really, there's conflict in all that, too, because of the use of the bottom. Um, but the bottom line is, I mean, I, I think we, uh, we only have something to gain uh, from doing this work and connecting with future generations of, of anglers and people that, you know, you know, could be the next oyster scientist that, that comes up with some big solution to, uh, to something that's affecting them. You know, that, that's, that's kind of my hope that we're planting those seeds for now and, and at least the future. And one of my happiest days um, at work was the day a buddy of mine text messaged me a picture of a keeper black sea bass that he caught at the Tillman Island reef. Wow. Cause habitat today, mm -hmm. which was five years ago, equaled, you know, that fish tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. cool. It's really yeah. cool. Yeah. And it can, I mean, we've done freshwater lakes too. Um, the state of Maryland has a really good program investing in lakes and habitat and lakes. Um, so to name a couple we've done in the last couple of years, it's uh, Blair's Valley Lake. Um, the Lake Habib out at Rocky Gap State Park has gotten some reef balls, uh, Cunningham Falls. Um, and actually Lake, Lake Habib got two years worth of reef balls. So some of the, some were um, actually built by a, a really cool partnership. So, the Union Sportsmen's Alliance. Um, that's a group of union tradesmen that that collectively get together and they're mm -hmm. a great group, I think, celebrating like their 25th anniversary. Um, they're all about getting the working man out or man or woman outdoors mm -hmm. to enjoy the outdoors mm -hmm. and, and show that ethic, but also give back to their communities. So they do little projects throughout the country. Mm -hmm. And because of some of our volunteer leadership and some of their leaders, we got together and had um, cement and plaster masons in uh in gloucester city new jersey which is basically camden new jersey we were working with them and it, when they would come on the weekend to do their uh their training for their to become an, they're an apprentice and then they're going to move up through the union ranks and be able to you know, hit the different pay scales and stuff um they're required to do a certain amount of training and and one of their leaders was he just was excited about volunteering and i think they built like 250 reef balls for us wow some of which um, ended up in some of those lakes. That's why it kind of mm. triggered my memory. But bottom line is, I mean, we get to build all these, these fantastic partnerships across the state with our, with our reef program. I could go on and on and on and tell the stories of different people that have stepped up, but that's it. I mean, people step up. Mm. You mentioned something about the, the freshwater lakes in Maryland, and I think this is a, a good little like segue that I know Deep Creek Lake has had an issue with hydrilla and zebra mussels, um, that that is a new thing. And I've heard a lot of chatter in, in the comments section, which is always a, a fantastic place to go for deep knowledge. <laughs> is there ever, I know the negatives about the zebra mussel, the gobies and the hydrilla, but on the flip side, we cannot also argue that the water quality has actually gone up. There's more abundance of bigger fish. And, and that has to do with some of these invasives that are probably showing a positive. In these situations where you get water that has a, a bad quality to it, why isn't this ever suggested as something to do? And, and this is why I want your opinion on it, because you're qualified to actually help restore some of these places. Because I know when I've, when I've talked to Odenkirk and things like that, where hydrilla will get in there and actually protect native aquatic vegetation and actually help it grow. 
Whereas before we said like, oh no, you just gotta like firebomb all of it. And then maybe Hydro will actually help the Potomac there for, for a couple of decades. And, and so I guess my thought is when you hear invasive, it's always kill, it's all bad. Is that true? It's all based on what you consider to be good or bad. And mm -hmm. that can vary on the individual level. Um, it can vary on the municipality or regulatory agency level, local, state, federal, global. Um, from yeah, an ecosystem no simple answer. What's that? I said, like, from the ecosystem health and at the political level, when you look at it from the data of just purely helping the water quality standpoint, because, like, I think Deep Creek is interesting because I would like to see in 10 years what happens to that. Because based on history, you should see an increased growth in the amount of aquatic vegetation there. You should also see cleaner water mm -hmm. if it's unchecked. And then it should equal some kind of equilibrium. Is that a bad thing? Well, in cleaner... All these things are are all relative, and mm -hmm. I'm, I don't. This isn't like I'm in the hot seat and can't answer a political question, right? Because, but it is political because simply because when I say political, I don't mean once. I don't mean like left versus right, and like yeah, yeah. Or that kind of thing. I mean, I mean, it ultimately is about making a decision um, that affects the public based um, on users. Yeah, and so it all depends on where you want to get. Like that straight bass chart we were showing, the target is our goal. There is debate as to whether that goal should be in place, and therefore somebody's good or bad is related to possibly their perspective of that goal. So, like cleaner water, do we mean more clarity? And then what comes from that? Uh, do we mean more oxygen because the plants are providing that oxygen? Are they are they stabilizing sediments that are that happen in a certain water body because because SAD does that? Um, or is the goal you know? And that's where actually it's extremely key in in like a scientific process and all these efforts that are being done by game and fish folks to be able to separate, you know, personal opinions and from, from the, this, the regimented and specific work that they do in the science, you know, using the scientific method and like in striped bass, um, just to give an example, there's a fishery management plan approved by the coast wide board. The board is made up of all the people that sit in the States that have striped bass so North Carolina, the Maine. we make, judgments and actually one of the sections of that plan is the goals and objectives so with deep creek it's not a you know it's a man-made lake right what are the goals of deep creek is it to maintain access for the boaters and shoreline property owners which always in a in a judgment or, or decision making tree carry a lot of weight you know they're a, a real estate tax taxpayer you know that that affects things um and and so i don't know all the specific goals of of deep creek um but this same thought process can can exist in every little decision point when it's a public resource and there's a public component and that's what leads to the complexity and also the frustration in engaging in the process that exists in this country we oversimplify things and pretend like it's biden versus trump versus obama versus bush and it's like no it's never that simple it's never red versus blue and so when it comes down to these invasives there's always a judgment call Invasive means that it's bad because non-native means it wasn't there originally. And we, we keep that, in theory, we keep that line in place. But intuitively, those words mean the same thing to some people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you have to know what conversation you're having before you pick and choose the words you use to describe something. But in the end, if it means, like to me, I mean like if it means the pike fishery thrives in deep creek and i might be able to go up there one day and catch a big one like hell yeah bring it in um now that said i shouldn't be if you know if I'm, there's a beautiful lake that i think would do better if it had hydrilla in it then i think it's wildly irresponsible for me or anybody else to take it there so hmm. it's kind of like this you got to know where you stand um personally i mean i've gone snakehead fishing and released them because i didn't feel like mm -hmm. you know, messing with it i didn't want to kill something i didn't eat um, but I released it in the water body where I caught it. Other times I've gone out bow fishing and gigging for them. And if one got near me, it was coming home. Mm -hmm. So even me personally, I changed my, my thought process. Right. I, I think the data, I, I think we need, what has it been? Shoot. Since the Gobi and the zebra mussels has been like 20 years. Like, I don't know, like the correct sample size to actually see that, to have good data on something like that, to know like the pros and cons yeah. of yeah. how that's impacted the environment. But I, I do think there needs to be a change in the definition of invasive. Cause I've heard people talk about that with the catfish, but it's like, guys, you know, smallmouth are technically an invasive species too. Like by definition, they are not native to some of these waterways. 
So but they're I mean, only invasive if somebody says that they're invasive, like by a standard. Non-native and invasive are not are not interchangeable words. They're different, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. like I don't know. I don't know if it's gonna get back to like the culture and educating people and making sure you understand that. Like but yeah, I don't know. That, that's that's it's me just difficult. Imagine. And you know, it's it's very difficult when in this day and age with the technology we have, we've lost the ability to have like accountable conversation. Mm -hmm. One yes. like person to person. In in person, in you know, face to face, where you're you're truly held accountable because you you say something like I've seen people say in the comment sections at times, you might get cracked in the nose, <laughs> but <laughs> that's not happening on social anymore. And I think like societally, is that especially the fishing community? I think people have gotten so like we're tribalistic. We're all oh, tribalistic. I, I think it's worse than ever. I could be wrong. No, 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 no. It, it is, and I think it's because of social media. I, I know, like, I mean, heck, I make my living doing this, but like, I I can tell you, like. It needs it. It feeds off of negativity. I know when a video will go viral based on how many people hate it, because people that hate comment and the algorithm likes that. And that's why like puppies getting thrown into a blender will always track better than like a documentary <laughs> article about the Civil War. Why? Because no one it doesn't get traction. It doesn't get the clicks. And, yeah. and I think it helps this self-fulfilling prophecy of, of negativity and this tribalism and it, you do see that because when I started this thing, and I remember when I, when I asked your friend to come on the show and he was like, so are you a kayak guy? Are you a bass guy? He's like, I just see the map behind me. I'm just, if it's a fish, it's a lake. That's what I am. People always ask me when I want to interview them, what tribe are you from? Mm -hmm. And that's how the heck can we make change when we are infighting ourselves? Because God love Trout Unlimited. At least all those guys are in lockstep. Mm -hmm. And that's why I feel like they can get so much stuff done. Well, well yeah, to his point, though, the, the, the key is the trout. I mean, that's the yeah. – and, and I do think about it. So you have cat fishermen. I didn't realize – I want to say the statistic I just read today was there's uh, 8 million pan fishermen. I don't know where – you know, if that's the United States or what. But, I'm like, wow, that's a lot. So, you know, we always have that conversation, too. Like, trout seems to get a lot of focus or a lot of money, a lot of funding. And is that proportional to the percentage of – Trout anglers, or or take the smallmouth. To your point, our, we our river rats love the smallmouth. Now you go up north; they're not big into the smallmouth, you know, or the, like they like the walleye or these different species. And so, so I'm and we're faced with that here at Lake Holiday as we're doing a stocking program. Now we all like the smallmouth. We've done smallmouth, walleye, and crappy, but but I, I I would like to put some rainbow trout in. And I've heard somebody else. I've had two or three people tell me that. I've had four people tell me no. I've had, you know, we look at the F1 strain and it's like the state's telling you no, uh, the, the hatchery guy's telling you no, but yet, you know, guys are catching 11 pounders out of Lake Frederick right here next to us. So it, it almost does, to your point, comes back to opinion and that end user and what what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, and that's where that, I think, that debate. But to your point, well, you got to find that compromise, um, that middle ground, and almost in some cases too, you focus more on the the habitat and uh, of the fishery that if it can sustain it can sustain multiple populations if they're in balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's that's it. I mean, it's always going to be complicated to achieve these outcomes. That right. In general, we can observe the past and guess what the future might look like, but we're, we're right. wrong all the time. And, and right. it's definitely easier when you're dealing with a lake ecosystem in the, in, in your understanding of it. Um, I mean, there's even interesting, like, accidental um, situation with, with eye anglers. So, you know, they created that platform for a specific purpose. And I'm, I'm going to say the years like 06. Um, it takes quite a while to evolve. The whole idea was that it could become like a personal logbook and anglers all over the place could use it. But as soon as the, the, the problem, the conflict, which was a conflict with Mother Nature, um, of these fish dying off, as soon as the fishery kind of came back, the amount of users using the app went down because it was one more thing for them to do mm. and they weren't going to do it anymore because the need wasn't there. And so right. that's something that's always going to happen. Um, it, also along the same lines, it, like it's that wasn't a conflict with person to person. But all these things, time time solves all these problems, right? Um, yeah. Whether it be the debate over snakeheads or, you know, your personal opinion may change right? as well. And and our community as a whole is interesting. And and one of the, like kind of back to the eye angler thing and, and the thing to, to 
related to like our power in collecting data. Um, so I'm trying to make this simpler than not because I know I can <laughs> talk about it for an hour and a half. Um, so in a closed system, you can technically count everything and get an idea of what's in but the system. It's the ocean, yeah. Yeah, okay. but like you can't do that in the ocean. You can't do that in the bay. You can't do that anywhere um, or, or, or mostly in tidal waters, right? So there is a system that is built on surveying people that go fishing. It's called the Marine Recreational Information Program, MRIP. It replaced a different acronym, MRFS, uh, Marine Recreational Fishing Statistical Survey System. Maybe? Wasn't this used on tuna back in the 80s to help with those? I feel like yeah, I read something about this, about the tuna in the Mediterranean Sea, because they had to like figure out that whole issue. Sorry. So, well, sorry. bluefins I can talk about too, but we're not going to go there yet. Um, <laughs> that's the tuna you're talking about. Um, yeah. No, this system is ba is saying that um, it's set up. It's it, it cuts up the calendar year into six different sections. And they're called mm -hmm. a wave, um, and this is a statistical survey. Um, so it's built by statisticians and a model, and, and like it's done in a certain way. It's not the only way to estimate angler catch and effort, but that's what it's designed for. And so it's a federal effort um, that the states take part in. The states get some funding uh, to to operate. States can actually increase the amount of funding invested in it. And what they're spending money on is intercepts. So if you go to a public landing in the tidal waters of the United States, you might be interviewed by somebody that is an intercept person. And they could have a clipboard and they could ask you, what were you fishing for? What was your number one target? What was your number two target? Uh, what did you catch? How many did you keep? May I see them? How many did you throw back? Um, and it asks some of these questions. And that is a specific piece of the survey, and that's done throughout the country. And then they had, for years, they would call household telephones in coastal zip codes. And so for many, many years, they were calling. You'd get a phone call. Hello, this is whoever from you know, the system. We can answer these questions. You can, only, you can imagine how many people would hang up. But then some people did answer the questions, and they were largely questions about the effort, so the number of days you go fishing. And then it shifted over time, and, and they've, they've now shifted to the point where they do a mail-in survey because they were finding that their data wasn't court, wasn't lining up right with, with what – I don't know exactly how they did it, but they're basically saying there's something wrong here. We're not getting the right number of samples, I guess, was the issue because people don't have household telephones anymore. And so the, – and originally, they were just calling coastal zip codes, not people that likely fished. So it automatically kept dwindling down their sample size. Well, now fast forward, they've gotten to the point now where you might get a card in the mail and that card is your effort survey. It's, it's I think it's called the FES, Fishing Effort Survey. Um, and they just did that and were for the first time ever had enough years in the data set where they could recalibrate the old system with the new system to use it for management. And that just happened. And that was actually a big, big, stressor in the striped bass conversation because it totally changed our understanding of the catch per unit effort like how many how much you caught for the amount of time you spent on the water it showed that angler there were there were more people catching more fish than what we thought before and therefore there were more fish in numbers in the waters th than we thought that makes sense. So, like that essentially happened with a lot of important mid-Atlantic species, um, and what it caused was in a situation where you had commercial versus recreational. Commercial has a quota. Recreational has there's millions of us, and we get a bag limit, a size limit, in a in a season. So they're guessing that the bag size and season will keep us within the constraints that the the resource can handle. So recreational is harder to track than than commercial. Of course, yeah, because there's at, at its peak there was like nine million recreational anglers on the Atlantic coast, or striped bass anglers on the Atlantic coast. Nine million, wow. But, so what it did was when it said, "Oh my gosh, rec anglers are being so much more successful," it essentially showed statistically that we had a bigger piece of the pie than we thought in the past, hmm. and that's something called allocation. So it's like how many fish are out there, and then who gets to kill them. So it immediately showed the balance of recreational take to commercial take as much bigger than they thought before. It used to be like 60-40. Now it's like 80-20. That's so cool. Yeah, well, and that led to a lot of the complexity of the politics. And I don't know how I got down this wormhole, but I know we were talking about lakes. <laughs> but 
that leads to the complexity of trying to understand what's out there. It's a survey to give us a basic understanding of the population and then the rate at which we take those animals out of the population, which is called a fishing mortality rate. Management also then brings in this thing called natural mortality. That is their assumption on the exponential decay rate of a population. So, so why is it so hard? Like, I, I'll bring this in there. When you look at the tuna thing compared to the striper, it seems like one's a little bit harder to deal with than the other. And why is that? Well, the deal with from a resource assessment or like the whole everything. Oh, let's just go. Yeah, you know, let's, let's let's go resource assessment because I think that'd be a little bit easier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the resource, and that's another thing that I would encourage people that they're if they're still listening. <laughs> I'm putting Jared to sleep with with all this stuff. I don't know. Like th th this is so fascinating because yeah, when you think about like the tuna thing, which is a science, like it is. Like I heard um with, with the tuna that you're talking about, you have to have. Is it true that you have to have like a federal person there when you take it out of the water? Because like, well, you no, can't... I'll get to that. I may not be 100 percent on top of everything, but yeah. Um, the my point is that. That if you look at like the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission website, that is a body of people and states from Maine to Florida to manage a resource. And that's a resource in state waters, which in the Atlantic is out to three miles. So now you go from three miles out to 200 miles. In 1976, there was a law called the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Management Act. And it might not be the exact name, but Magnuson-Stevens. And it's still in place. It's been updated multiple times. But in 1976, we said, hey... This is our exclusive economic zone from three miles to 200. Hmm. And now we're going to manage all these activities that exist here, specifically fisheries when it comes to Magnuson. Beyond that, you have international. And so a tuna happens to fall into a migratory species, highly migratory species category, and they're, they exist internationally. So like you mentioned in the Mediterranean, one thing in the 90s that started to pop up was, was concerns over um, um, bluefin tuna populations. And I kind of watched this. I was literally in high school and into college and started fishing with people that helped do some of the studies because you have to assess the resource first and then you figure out who gets to kill <laughs> essentially. Bless you. <laughs> and um, what, what we ended up finding was through using technology like tagging surveys. Um, it's actually what my hat says, tag Chesapeake. Oh. We got to talk, talk about that a little bit <laughs> before <Yeah>. we're done. <laughs> um, but um, through tagging Nope, they froze. Okay. There I am, I'm back. Through tagging studies, we can tell that you tag a fish, you capture its information at that point, and then you hope that somebody else catches it. That is also a massive part of estimating a population of fish, striped mm -hmm. bass, many, many other fish. Um, and there's all these different, like, really complicated ways of, of like, sorting through that data that are based on history and studies and everything else. But ultimately, they started doing studies with the bluefins to figure out, like, what was the trade between the Gulf and the Mediterranean? And are our juvenile class bluefins that we're catching in the mid-Atlantic that are like, you know, 40 to 80 pounds, are they born in the Mediterranean? Are they born in the Gulf? Where are they coming from? And then how do you go ahead and decide who gets to kill what and at what size? Um, and so all that's done through what's called ICAT, which is the International Commission for Atlantic Tunas, maybe? Is hmm. the ICAT? Either way, it's a international body that decides what happens with tunas in the Atlantic. Um, and it could have, if the A is not Atlantic, then it's a worldwide thing. But either way, there's these inter, uh, there's these diplomatic bodies that deal internationally on who gets to kill what fish. And wow. so the U.S. has our federal law. And beyond that, I mean, think of it like almost like the United Nations for highly migratory species. All the states come around together and figure out what do we do based on their science our science, their studies, and then their fisheries, et cetera, to determine who's allowed to legally catch stuff. Then you throw in, when with like tunas, you throw in all the illegal fisheries and stuff that's happening in like third world countries that don't have this structure. Um, and it even further complicates like who's using the resource. But um, for us, because they're a highly migratory species, um, that is a body of people that sit, like, so I'm on the commission for state waters every state gets three people. In federal waters, there's what's called a council process, and the states get a certain number of seats on the council. The council is a body of people that can be selected by the governor, ultimately approved by the Secretary of Commerce um, that oversees the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is uh, now referred to as NOAA Fisheries. 
Um, so the National Oceanic Atmos Atmospheric Administration oversees fisheries. Hmm. So that hierarchy of federal government gets to determine who are the people that sit on the council and the council is an advisory body to NOAA that can actually help make rules. That council does not make the tuna rules or the wahoo or the, the marlin, um, you know, some of these other highly migratory species. That highly migratory species panel actually exists. They, they operate out of Silver Spring, Maryland, the, the NOAA headquarters, and they the reason that like I couldn't be appointed to that is because it's so complicated internationally. It's just important to have like career staff engaged in those conversations. CCA's um, some of our key leaders over the years have actually served on that in ICAT and in some of the tuna stuff, and and really shaped like the process from the '80s through to today to make sure that conservation is considered. Um, it's very difficult for the U.S. to tell another another country what they can and can't do with these resources, but that's where diplomacy comes in. That's where money and, you know, defense, uh, defense stuff and, and all sorts of things come into play, like fish get caught up in that. So anyway, back to the permit. The whole idea of the permit is to track information. It's essentially a survey to track information about what is a fisherman doing. And so as soon as a population becomes a population of concern in some way, shape or form, these systems get put in place. And it's to boil it down, it's a matter of accountability. So anytime you're given a privilege or access to a resource, sometimes accountability measures are put in place to make sure that you're, they, they can count your impact. Um, and that's where all this data comes from. Like you go back to trout fishing. Well, part of the trout stamp is not only to count how many people trout fish, at least the ones that do it legally, but it's also to charge another five bucks or 10 bucks, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. to then fuel the system so that the system can have enough demand. And that's a, again, that's kind of like we we're doing hatcheries and stuff. But yeah, you know, you know, Jared and I talked about this too, about like you have a trout stamp, so you know how many people are like trout fishing. And mm -hmm. it's like, why is that not done for how many bass fishermen are there? How many bluegill fishermen? Like, how do you yeah. track that to know where you need to do? Like, you know, in general, like how many people are going to go trout fishing, right, Jared? But you don't know, like how many of your base of a blank amount, a million people specifically target one species? Right. And that's what a license was created for. I mean, a license was created to be able to count people and also provide funding through the, you know, the financial transaction to the agency um, to do the, whatever the work is that, that in theory, the public supports. Um, and for like the tuna thing, it's to be consistent with, um, with these international agreements. You need to know how many people are out there fishing for them, what their success rates are. Um, also, a great deal of biological sampling comes from recreational and commercial caught HMS species. Um, the white marlin open open today. Um, I'm sure the scales just closed. Maybe um, there's biologists and scientists taking samples from those fish for various studies of those species that will benefit the international world. Um, and that 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 happens all the way down the scale from a bluegill all the way up. But but from a we do know how many people are going fishing if they buy a license. So that's that's an important take home message. And then tidal water um, and to support the MRIP program. Um, many a handful of years ago, um, a program was created to create basically yellow pages of fishermen. And that was partly to get at this challenge of like, all right, we're calling household telephones, but we're not getting the sample size we need to be statistically valid. There's got to be a better way. And so. Um, the feds basically said, hey, states, if you want to continue to get certain dollars for certain things, you need to create a license system. So that way we have an idea of how many people you're letting fish in state and or federal waters. So that we have an idea of the, the denominator, basically, like how many people are out there. Um, and that from there, there goes the permits and everything else. I mean, every species like blue line tile fish is a good example. We weren't seeing populations move in the right direction and they had no real good data on them because they're a um, I, I can't think of the name of the term right now, but it's it's basically a, um, a not a, not a frequently caught fish, so there's not a lot of data. So to better answer the questions about their population, they went, all right, well, we really don't know how many people are out there, we don't, so we can't compare their success rates. So from now on, if you're going to go blue line tile fishing, you've got to you've got to get a federal permit, and then you've mm -hmm. got to report your catch so that the data can be captured. Same reason why there's a tag on a bluefin, you know, the data needs to be captured. And so, like to your question, you asked that a federal person has to be there to witness you take a fish out of your boat or out of the water. Um, I don't know that, that that is the case, but I know that a lot of people, um, when I used to offshore fish a lot, 
when you would come back to the dock, if you're like West Ocean City, if you're going to put your boat on a trailer and leave and you had a bluefin in your boat, you were supposed to get out of your boat, go get the card with the tag from one of the various places around the marina, go back to your boat, tag the fish, fill out the card before you pull your boat out of the water. Wow. And that is a line they drew so that somebody that's poaching mm-hmm. has that kind of gauntlet to run through and they can put a resource officer right there. And it's real simple. If that fish is legal. Step one is it has a tag. No tag. Boom. There's a ticket. Hmm. And so a lot of these things that you, you scratch your head and you go, why is this? Like, I feel like I'm doing my taxes to go fishing. It doesn't mean that's a like, I don't, I don't think paperwork's a good thing, right? Nobody that's wants that. You want to go fishing, but there's a reason and there's usually a means to an end, whether it's good or bad. It's up to the individual to decide. Dang. Yeah. No, that's, it's a necessary evil. It really is. Yeah. Um, I want you to talk about that tag program. Yeah. So tag Chesapeake supported by my good friends at Under Armour or our good <laughs> friends, our community. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the, the wreck angler use of the resource is an important part of understanding what's happening out there, but also tags. And so when you tag surveys are done by agencies all over, there's lots of different technology. Um, some of the bluefin tags were, were pop-up satellite tags that, that tracked all sorts of great information. You know, if you haven't seen like the, the O search, the great white shark work, I mean, that stuff's mm-hmm. awesome. Um, but in the Bay generally over, over the last many years, I mean, 20 years, um, there's been less and less focus on on tagging, the tagging of striped bass for migratory studies. And um, I think that's one of the things that suffered through some budget cuts, in, in my opinion, at least. I could be wrong there. Um, but ultimately, in the stock assessment, if anybody reads it, would see that there's um, there's certain information that's gleaned from tag returns. And so if you, if you take a little plastic tag and you stick it in a fish, you send it off. That's not a data point. Well, it's a starting data point. You measure the fish's length. You, you record where you caught it. And you may weigh it if, if possible. And then you send it off into, into the ocean or into the bay. Until you catch it, you have no idea what happened to it. So you can guess. And once you've done it enough, and you know, thankfully through our scientific structure in this country, you know, they share information through academia and, and these agencies. So you can look at studies and see, you know, you design a study to try and achieve a certain outcome and and uh, tell you something about these fish. And then therefore you're learning something about their life cycle, uh, their migratory patterns. And so um, there's lots of different tagging programs. And, and many years ago, um, CCA partnered with the American Littoral Society out of New Jersey. Um, they have a tagging program. It's a, a yellow tag that goes behind the, uh, the rear dorsal of a fish above the spine kind of like the meaty section above, you know, in front of the tail, behind the rear dorsal and above the spine. And they would stick this plastic tag through there and tie a knot or click, clip it into a, a loop tag. And um, that's just one technique. And one of our volunteers came along and said, hey, I've been doing this this tagging program with, with American Littoral Society. Anybody can do it. Would you want to create a partnership with CCA? And so I reached out to their tagging director and I said, hey, you know, how's this work? And any fishing club, any organization can join their tagging program uh, tomorrow and, and donate some money and then purchase some of their tags. And what that does is allows you to tag a fish and then you get a little postcard. You fill out the postcard and um, and send it off. I usually have a pile of them sitting here. I, I don't right now. And guys, don't worry about it. Everything will be linked in the episode description down below. There you go. There you go. So you can tag this fish. And then fill out the information and mail it to New Jersey. They put it into a big database. And then if and when your fish is caught, you get a letter. You get this little patch, you know, a little goldfish patch. And then you get told, like, what happened to your fish? That's really cool. Yeah, and it's it's a citizen science project, um, meaning that it's not a specifically designed scientific study by academia, by a master's student, by a doctoral you know, thesis or whatever it might be. Um, and there's there's certain information you can glean from that. There's certain information you can't. Um, with the fisheries biologists, just like that juvenile abundance index, they do it the same way every single time. So that way they're controlling the process mm-hmm. as part of the scientific process. And that same team of folks actually in Maryland, um, in the upper bay, that area kind of like above Pools Island all the way up to the flats, they will do a drift gillnet survey in the spring. 
another survey I've been on, and they will set different panels of net, different sized mesh, drift gill net, because that's what's legal in Maryland, and that's the technique they use. Uh, so it's corks along the top, weight along the bottom. Ideally, the, the panel of, of mesh, I mean, just goes down the bay like that. Mm. And, you know, the fish bump into it. Um, and that one, they actually slid open the belly of the fish and and put in, um, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the tag. Um, but the it's a plastic, little plastic piece with a serial code on it, a serial number, and then a streamer that sticks into the middle of it. And so on the internal, it's called an internal anchor tag. So the internal anchor has the, the serial number on it. So does the streamer. And this is done in the Bay, in the Potomac, and then also um, uh, offshore in the wintertime by Fish and Wildlife, um, uh, Maryland DNR, uh, Virginia Marine Resource Commission. And those are spawning stock biomass um, tagging studies. So we have the Citizen Science Project that's just, Anybody can do it anytime, and there's a certain list of species that you can tag. You've got the agency doing this work, and that's like again, I've been out on those trips and really enjoyed them. But um, our community is always looking for something else to do, and so um, you know, and support data that the agencies aren't capturing anymore. So, working with Under Armour, um, we established the, the the Tag Chesapeake program, and so it's tagchesapeake.org. Uh, it's brand new to the point where it hasn't really even been promoted yet. Um, and that's because of what I'll talk about next. Um, but ultimately, we have this reward for capture poster that's going to be launched out launch soon. Um, I just happen to have one sitting here on the desk. And what it says on there is that this is on, on the Tag Chesapeake website. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do was to create a program that anybody could partner with. And so we didn't make tag Maryland because I'm the director of, Ch of, you know, CCA Maryland. And so I want to go tag Chesapeake. Let's do Bay wide. Like any chance we can volunteer, we can, we can empower volunteers and partners to improve fisheries, catch data or fisheries data. And then we're all winning. Um, and so that's what we created the program in the spirit of. And so we have a fulfillment partner, um, an online store. It's called tide tide outfitters. Um, they fulfill the prize. But the idea is you catch your fish. It says on the tag, um, visit tagchesapeake.org. On the other side, it's call 877, gosh, I can't remember, 392 tag, I think, or something like that. Um, and, uh, no, 392 fish, I think is what it is. But anyway, um, and, and right now there's like about, I think about 90 straight bass swimming around the bay uh, with two tags sticking out of them. Hmm. Um, one is what's called a T-bar tag. And that goes in with a, um, it's like a retail tag. It was on a tag, you know, tagged your shirt. Um, and then on the, on the end of it is like a heat shrink plastic with that data screen printed onto it or the, those numbers. And, and then a six, a six uh, digit number for the serial number of the fish. And then the other side is a dart tag. And so a dart tag is you use a needle. It's shaped like a harpoon. You stick it in the fish and then pull it out. So okay. the T-bar goes in with the retail gun. You click it, click it. And the reason we're doing this is if you look in the 2018 straight bass benchmark stock assessment uh, and you look at the research priorities, one of the research priorities buried in that massive, massive document was that we don't understand the tag retention rates in juvenile straight bass. So if you want to know something about a juvenile straight bass's migratory patterns, if you want to know something about their mortality, uh, you're going to need to understand the tag retention rates in juvenile striped bass. So we focused on, we've been talking a lot in management about the mortality rate that, that died when they released. Um, we've been talking a lot about who should take cuts in reductions, who has the bigger impact, you know, more political or, or um, kind of um, allocation type discussions. And every single time I'm like, well, what's the data show for this? What do we know about this? What do we know about that? I'm thinking it through the data and the science and a bigger picture than just who gets to catch what. And every single time, oh, well, we don't have the tagging in data anymore. We stopped that program. Oh, we don't have this. We stopped that. So again, we decided to step up. And so I don't know what this will tell us. I don't know what the program will tell us, but our goal is that um, we've, we've stopped tagging right now. We, we tagged through um, late May, June, and, and just a touch into early July until water temperatures got too high. Uh, we don't want to bias the data. We don't want the data. Um, we don't want to be tagging fish that then, you know, die from hot water. That doesn't tell us anything. We know that happens already. 
So why impact the resource when it's hot out in the summertime? Um, so we're waiting for water temps to get down below 80 again, uh, and then we'll get out there tagging. And so what we're doing is actually training um, guys. I swear I've got a kid around here somewhere. Um, but we're tra training guys, gals, whoever, to be trained taggers so mm -hmm. that you remove some bias. And so that's what separates us from, you know, we're citizen science in the fact that volunteers are doing it or community science and the fact that our community is supporting it. But we're doing a structured way. We're making sure that the tag technique is done the same every time. So if I do it or one of you guys do it, it's the same. We're all on the same page. We've stuck it in the fish in the same location because ultimately I got to draw a little design, a little uh, diagram real quick and explain how these tags work. It's kind of cool. They have to get into the fish in a certain spot. So let's pretend this is a cross section of a fish. I cut its head off. All right. These are his pec fins. Kind of looks like a whale. Um, like this would be the rib cage. There's the spine. And then there's the, the dorsal. Huh. So give me a second. What I just drew right there is what a T bar tag does. So you stick this gun in underneath the scale from this side. You stick, you stick the needle in and you want to get the needle past the center line of that fish. So okay. when you're cleaning a fish and you notice like underneath the dorsal fin, there's all like the little like tissue and such that, that is up there. Um, and that's what you're actually trying to get the tag into. So it goes to the other side and then the T part of the plastic is in that tissue. And so if you do that, you then, once you tag the fish, you, you, tug on it a little bit and that way you know that the tag was deployed properly the harpoon dart you do the same thing you just poke through the center line of the fish get behind one of those little bones and that way you know that your fish when it, you know a year from now when only one of those tags is in that fish you're answering the question we're trying to answer in this study which is which tag type is retained longer in juvenile striped bass as they grow mm. okay and they grow quickly in their juvenile stages. So anything that you would implant in something that grows quickly is going to change. So it's that, that is one little piece of what we're studying right now. And it's kind of, it's exciting to me, of course, I got to literally write the study with great guidance by Maryland, Virginia, Fish and Wildlife, the ASMFC people. Um, we got to write this study, but again, we don't know what it's going to tell us. But one thing I did want to guarantee is that, that, you know, a, a company, like Under Armour, um, a partner like Tide Outfitters, and a membership organization like CCA Maryland is willing to step up, raise money, do the work, and say, hey, when everybody else was just complaining about the rules, we were the ones trying to better our scientific understanding of this resource because it is so important to us. And that has been repeated at CCA throughout our entire history and repeated at every sportsman representative organization, every company. I mean, a tackle shop, you pay excise taxes on everything you sell to support this same kind of work being done, you know, by agencies throughout our country. I mean, who else in the world does that? The answer is nobody. It's the conservation model that we created in, in this country because all of us care so much to, to put our trophies on the wall and feed our families with them. And, mm -hmm. you know, care so much about this resource that, that just makes us uh, care about it so much. We turn tribal and fight with each other over it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amen to that. Dave, this has been, this is so, this is awesome. Like, I mean, I, I absolutely love talking about this stuff and it's something that people really need to, again, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today as well. Please try to support like his groups and in a well with his sponsors, Under Armour specifically, as, as you said. Jared, do you have anything else? No, I think it was very detailed, a lot of information and, and that, no, it was good. It's good, a lot of information. It's something that I think, you know, I look at too is, building the network and relationships and connections uh as resources and you know to refer people and and just it, it's an ongoing thing i mean i think it's something we can continue to, to reach out and talk about and moving forward in years to come yeah i mean we all learn so much from each other and um i actually have a podcast too that i haven't been doing recently um just because there's so much going on but we named it um what's on the line mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. Because we all want to know what's on the line. What are we catching? But also from a from a conservation, from a policy, from like what's coming next, like what is on the line? You know, mm -hmm. What are the real issues that are in front of us? And I always said when I was you know, creating it, 
especially with the pandemic, but even before that, you know, with social media and stuff, I feel like we've lost sitting around the coffee pot, you know, learning from each other in the way that we used to in the hunting and fishing community. Mm -hmm. And that's just such an important piece of our fabric of our country of these small shops and locations that people can sit around and hang out. And if you can't tell, I love nothing more than sitting around and BSing. Um, I know we talked a lot at ICAST, but I think we're setting a record here tonight. And but this is what it's about. We have so much to learn from each other. And if we let it happen, we can be the mentor and the mentee in the same conversation with the same people. Uh, and that's what's beautiful about this experience, and this opportunity we have. Um, you know, there's so many great resources in this country that you know, could do better, but there's also plenty that, that are out there. And if you open your mind a little bit, um, I've gotten to the point where I used to drive to coastal North Carolina if I had a chance to fish to try and catch a big tuna or marlin or wahoo. And now if you ask me, you know, hey, where do you want to go fishing tomorrow? I'd tell you if I caught a bluegill on a three weight, you know, the reservoir up the street from my house, that'd be better than a blue marlin. Right. You know? uh, good. How lucky are we that we can do that? Mm -hmm. No, I and mean, we live in such a great area. And then guys, again, like, please, please support him. Please support what he's doing. He's really helping the next generation to be able to have a resource here. And that's what we're trying to do here with Fishing the DMV is really trying to just bring the conversation to the forefront of our local area. And so these conversations can be had because there are so mm -hmm. many people that I run into either in the comment section or out when I'm walking about that don't know this stuff. And mm -hmm. it's because it's not there in their face. You know, if I tell somebody to watch a video online, they're more receptive than going into Congress and reading a bill. Like it's just human nature. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully we can do that here. Um, Dave, anything else that any, any sponsor plugs you want to do nope. before we get out of here? All right, guys. Uh, I really wanted to set the three-hour mark, but I got some paperwork. I got to get done. Uh, we'll see you guys next time on the DMV. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.